How's it going, folks? Welcome to another fun at-home table read. Tonight, we're jumping into, honestly, one of my favorite, if not my favorite Martin Short movie, Inner Space. This is, uh, honestly, I love this movie. I cannot wait to see how the script uh, is for this one. So let's get right into introducing ourselves. Okay, hello. My name is George, and I'm going to be doing the action description. I'm Logan. I'm going to be reading Tuck. Hi, I'm Anne. I will be reading for Lydia. I'm Eric. I'll be reading the role of Jack Potter. Hello, I am Mary. I will be reading for Dr. Kanker. I am Angie, and I'm reading Scrimshaw. All right. Well, George, take us away. All right. Inner Space by Jeffrey Bohm. Uh, fade in. Interior hotel banquet room. Night. A crowded cocktail party is in progress. Open bar and huge buffet table. A well-dressed, predominantly male crowd in attendance. Uniforms from all branches of the military are in evidence everywhere. Camera prowls through the room, picking up random bits of conversation. A television news crew reporting live from the scene comes into frame. Bob, I think that you and the viewers at home can see this room behind me is packed to overflowing. Former astronauts, space shuttle crew members, Washington bigwigs, Pentagon officials, well, you name it, and they're here in San Francisco tonight to celebrate the 30th anniversary of NASA, the National Aeronautics and... The camera moves off, eventually finds Lydia Maxwell, a knockout brunette in her early 30s. She's engaged in earnest conversation with a man whose eyes are seen to wander over her anatomy as they talk. We'll call him Roving Eyes. Camera pans to Tuck Pendleton, emerging drunkenly into the banquet room from a door marked No Admittance and crashing head-on into a busboy with a loaded tray of dirty dishes. The busboy is knocked for a loop and the dishes smashed to the floor. Tuck reacts with inebriated indignation. He points to the no admittance sign. How come it says restrooms, but it's really the damn kitchen? The busboy looks baffled, and Tuck moves off with his dignity intact. Uh, noticing that his glass is empty, he shoulders his way to the bar. Cuddy. Up. As he waits for his drink, we see that Tuck's rugged good looks are fading slightly, and his once square jaw is in need of a closer shave. His Navy captain's uniform, stretched tightly across his chest, suggests that several pounds have been added since the last fitting. As Tuck receives his drink from the bartender, a disturbance is heard to break out somewhere across the room. What are you doing? That's my tape recorder! Roving eyes indicates a small Sony protruding from Lydia's clutch purse. You can't do that, young lady. Give that to me! He swipes the recorder from her purse. Hey! Other party goers turn and look, so does Tuck. His eyes blaze, he storms over. What's going on here? Tuck! The trouble, Lydia? He stole my tape recorder. She was recording my conversation! I told you I worked for a newspaper. And this is a cocktail party, not a damn news conference! Give it back to me, please! You heard the lady. Hand it over! Roving eyes look startled by Tuck's abusive tone. I said, hand it over, you damn pencil neck civilian! Suddenly the room falls silent, and Tuck realizes that all eyes are upon him. Captain, you're drunk. Tuck looks embarrassed. He looks down at his drink, then looks up again with a big foolish grin on his face. Well, he's right. I'm drunk. Guess I owe these folks an apology, Lydia. Uh, okay. She puts her hand on his arm, sorry. Okay, Tuck, get it. Tuck pulls away from her. And not until I apologize to these people. We got some real famous all-American hero types with us tonight. Space walkers, and moon walkers, and Earth orbiters. It's obvious who Tuck is talking about. They stand there in their crisp uniforms with short hair, erect postures, and disapproving expressions. Uh, Tuck is standing before a display of large rocket models charting the history of the space program. You boys have all gone up in these babies. Hats off to you. I envy you fellows. Uh, most excitement I ever had was the time I landed a crippled F-14 on the deck of a rocking flat top with zero visibility, nose gear. Tuck sees Rusty, one of the ex-astronauts in the crowd, turn away in disgust. Don't turn your back on me, Rusty. At least when my moment of truth came, I didn't take a dump down the leg of my flight suit. 
that rings any bells for you. Rusty looks enraged. He advances toward Tuck. But Tuck stands his ground, smiles, and drops Rusty with a hooking right fist. Uproar. Two young Marines rush up to Tuck. Take it easy, Captain. Only two of you? Tuck raises his fist. The Marines exchange a look. They know that they have no alternative. Sorry, Captain. Pow. Tuck takes it on the chin. He goes tumbling backwards into the rocket display. The models bang into each other like falling dominoes. Onlookers gasp and scream. The TV news crew hurries over. They turn on their lights and roll tape. Who is he? Captain Tuck Pendleton, ma'am. The news correspondent looks disappointed. Kill it, boys. He's nobody. Tuck props himself up on one elbow and works his jaw. Lydia rushes to his side. Oh, Tuck. Are you all right? Tuck gives her a dazed expression. No one else offers assistance. They look upon Tuck as a complete disgrace. Then one man comes forward, dressed in a business suit. Tuck's own age, clean cut, athletic looking. <laughs> his name is Pete Blanchard. He offers Tuck his hand. Tuck looks up at Blanchard and smiles sadly. Where's his uniform, Pete? Blanchard pulls Tuck to his feet. I grew up, Tuck. Wear a suit now. Take him home, Lydia. Lydia begins to lead Tuck away, but she leaves his side for a brief moment to snatch back her tape recorder from roving eyes' unsuspecting hand. Pencil neck. You should have had your press credentials revoked. Write a letter to your congressman. Lydia marches off, reclaims Tuck, who waits for her on tottering legs and heads for the door. Roving eyes watches them go. Pete Blanchard comes up beside him. I am my congressman. Exterior hotel entrance night. Tuck and Lydia emerge from the hotel, Tuck's arm draped around Lydia's shoulder for support. And you said you weren't coming tonight. No, I said I wasn't invited. They approach the parking valet. Lydia hands them her claim check. Interior, Lydia's car traveling night. Tuck is slumped in the passenger seat as Lydia drives him home. She glances at him with a concerned expression. Don't give me that look. That look. That poor, pitiful Tuck look. <sighs> Had a great time tonight. I like getting drunk. I enjoy being hit in the face. Lydia rolls her eyes at Tuck's hopelessness. Tuck picks up the tape recorder from the car seat. So it's on this anyway. I'm looking a story. Should have guessed. It's a good story. Not that you'll ever know, of course. You never read any of my articles. That's not so. Rather one about me. You think... I think you only looked at the pictures. Well, I got to admit, those were great pictures. Maybe I should get the mustache bigger. Tuck takes a moment to mull this over, removing a pocket flask from beneath his uniform in the process. Okay. Tell me about the story. Ooh. Espionage in Silicon Valley. The buying and selling of advanced technological secrets. Hmm. That's why I had my tape recorder with me. Every high-tech company on the West Coast was represented at that party tonight. Well, you're right about one thing, Lydia. I ain't gonna read it. Interior Tuck's house night. Tuck and Lydia enter. Tuck turns on a light. The place is a cramped, unkempt bachelor's den. Despite the usual clutter, Lydia notices right away a new element in the disarray. Biological charts, books, and models, all of which pertain to the internal workings of rabbits. She picks up one of the models. What's this? Nothing. Just some homework I'm doing. Tuck takes it from her hand and puts it down. How about a drink? I can't stay, Tuck. Just for a minute. I know what you'd like. Tea. Can I fix you some tea? No, Tuck, I... Tuck goes into the kitchen, begins to rummage through the cabinets. Hey, what's tea coming again? A can, a jar, <laughs> wait, I remember little bags, right? Oh, yeah, here they are. I'm not staying, Tuck. Tuck can see she means it. His expression turns serious. Go. Oh. He puts his arms around her. Tuck. He begins to nuzzle her neck. I love your perfume. What's it called again? I don't wear perfume. Come on, what's it called again? 
He's breaking down her resistance. Midnight lace. Smells so good. Don't go, Lydia. He kisses her. She fights it, but then melts. Interior Tuck's bedroom, dawn. Tuck is asleep in bed, but Lydia is dressed. She's leaving. She gives Tuck a farewell glance, then slips quietly out of the room. But the slamming of the front door awakens Tuck. He realizes that Lydia is gone. Hey, Lydia? Then from outside the house, he hears his car, her car engine groan as it tries to fire up. Wait, Lydia! Tuck jumps from the bed. He's naked. He wraps the sheet around himself and stubs his toe on the bed leg. Exterior Tuck's house, Dawn. Tuck hops out of the house, favoring his injured toe, holding the sheet around his waist. Lydia is inside her car, desperately trying to get it started. Wait, Lydia, wait! Tuck rushes up to the car window. Where are you going? I'm leaving, Tuck. Don't try to stop me. Our relationship has no future, and you know it. You drink too much. You fight too much. God, this won't start. You don't value anything, and you don't destroy, or I'm sorry, you destroy everything that's good in your life. You ruin it, you throw it away, and if I stayed any longer, I'd be next. Lydia! You're a big, dumb palooka, Tuck, and I don't know, and I'm sorry, and I know I love you, but I don't think we should see each other again for a long, long time. With that, Lydia drives off in a cloud of white exhaust smoke. Tuck stands in the street in the dawn's early light, clutching the sheet, his head and toe throbbing, bewildered and alone. Resolve to Exterior Suburban Medical Building, Day. Title, The Silicon Valley, Two Months Later. Interior, A Doctor's Office, Day. Jack Putter sits on the examination table. He's an agreeable-looking fellow in his mid-thirties. Dr. Greenbush leans against the counter, arms folded across his chest, in an attitude of nonchalance that approaches total disinterest. Um, feels like it, it starts about here and then and swoops down and comes up to here, then zoom! Heads back down to about here, and then um, when I start to feel nauseous and... Greenbush tries unsuccessfully to stifle a yawn. Am I boring you? No, Jack. Because if I'm boring you, just tell me. That you're not the only, only uh, internist in the phone book, you know. Jack, please. Let's not have a falling out. Your monthly office visit is the cornerstone of my entire medical practice. Anything beside nausea? Um, headaches, a big pound headaches, um, lots of pain. Headaches, okay. And anything else? Yeah, the dream. Mm. Wanna hear it? Okay. Um, I'm at work, I'm at the market. Uh, I'm, I'm working one of the registers. The next customer is this lady with bright orange hair, Mrs. Mulrooney. She's a regular, she's uh, wearing those pointy, you know, Harley Quinn sunglasses with little snarkly things in them and a lime green jumpsuit with a three inch wide red vinyl belt. <sighs> Very vivid. Yeah, um, I have the same dream every night. Um, anyway, I'm passing your stuff over the barcode scanner and I don't notice it, but the computer's gone nuts and it's ringing up all the wrong prices. I mean, $1,200 for a can of coffee. So when I'm done, I look at the register and at the total is like over $100,000. So Mrs. Moroni says to me, real calm, I don't carry that kind of money on me, sweetie. Will you take this instead? She reaches down the purse, comes out with 357 Magnum, this long, and then and shoves the barrel into my face and pulls back on the trigger. And that's when I wake up screaming. The sweat is pouring off Jack's face. Greenbush regards him impassively. Is that it? Yeah. What do you think? I won't think anything until we run the usual tests. S slip out of those clothes, would you? With that, Greenbush exits the exam room. Interior Greenbush's private office, day. Jack, wearing his street clothes, sits in front of Greenbush's desk. Greenbush bustles into the office with Jack's test results under his arm. Jack regards him anxiously. You're fine, Jack. I can't find anything wrong with you. Jack looks disappointed. What? Everything checks out. Jack can't believe his ears. He seems ready to demand his money back. Um, you're, un you're under a lot of stress. However, you're too uptight, Jack. Uptight? Oh, are you sure that's the correct medical term? Look, do 
you have any vacation time coming? You need a rest. Get away for some R and R, peace and quiet. That's my prescription for you. Hold on, Jack. Thinking it over. Doesn't sound like such a bad idea. Exterior large suburban supermarket. Day. A VW bug speeds into the parking lot of a Ralph's Market. Jack jumps from the car and races towards the entrance. Interior Ralph's Market. Day. Very busy. Many shoppers. Jack hurries into the market and grabs his apron. A name tag clipped to it reads, Jay Putter, assistant manager. As Jack ties the apron behind his back, Mr. Wormwood, the market manager, comes up beside him. Jack, where have you been? Sorry, Mr. Wormwood, uh, a doctor's appointment. Are you all right? Uh, I'm fine. Um, do we aspirin on you? <laughs> checkout aisles later. Jack walks down the row of checkout aisles looking to see where he can lend a hand. He stops at the aisle where Wendy, an attractive young blonde, is working the register. Jack begins to bag Wendy's uh, customers' groceries, ever so often stealing a glance her way. Eventually... Uh, we had a date last night, you know? Huh? Uh, our date. Last night. I forgot, okay? You forgot? How could you forget? Look, Jack, I told you already, if you're going to be a part of my life, you can't hassle me about stuff. Jack gives her a long, baffled look. Wendy, I'm not part of your life. To which Wendy merely shrugs her shoulders and snaps her gum. Cut to produce department. Dr. David Niles pushes a shopping cart between the crates of fresh vegetables. He's a studious young man with dark, wavy hair and tortoise shell glasses. There's another man with him. We recognize this man as Pete Blanchard from the NASA cocktail party. Blanchard seems ill at ease and very much out of place in these surroundings. Great place to have a meeting. Good as any. Do these bananas look right to you? Let's get to the point, all right? Okay. We've made a breakthrough. The satellite missile guidance system. Ah, uh, we haven't perfected that just yet. We got a bit sidetracked. Blanchard draws back apprehensively. What are you talking about? I'm talking about the world and an eyedropper. Blanchard looks baffled. Niles wheels his cart toward the produce bins. Blanchard hurries along beside him. Miniaturization. We can shrink anything. Right down to the size of a pea. Even smaller than that. Blanchard seems skeptical. Bullshit. We brought in Ozzie Wexler. The name draws a blank with Blanchard. The man who invented Action Man, the 3D video game. Action Man didn't work. Yes, it did. Well, the bottom dropped out of the video market, that's all. The public never gave it a chance. Blanchard seems totally exasperated and pissed off. Come and see for yourself what we've done. All right, set it up. But you better have something. Niles, or I'm putting the plug on you and the entire misfit operation. With that, Blanchard marches off. Dissolve to exterior, somewhere in Silicon Valley morning. Morning traffic crawls along a freeway interchange. Smog and mist hang in the air. Camera locates a rambling one-story industrial complex in the shadow of a freeway overpass. Closer on complex. A chain link fence surrounds the property. A sign on the fence reads, Centigrated Vector Scope Laboratories. Interior Vector Scope Lab. The lab looks cluttered and disorganized. A labyrinth of wires and cables snake across the floor. The numerous pieces of scientific equipment look exposed, functional, and well used. In the center of the lab stands a large, impressive looking plexiglass geodes geodesic dome. Youthful lab technicians wearing photo ID badges go about their business with obvious enthusiasm. Ozzie Wexler is being videotaped by another lab technician. Uh, experiment number 27G5000, time 800 hours, date 526. <clears throat> a full grown male will be placed inside a submersible pod of the type used in deep sea exploration, miniaturized and introduced into the system of a living organism. In this case, the system of a common lepus cuniculus or white laboratory rabbit. Ozzy stops, notices that the lab tech has pointed the video camera away. What are you doing? Uh, panning to the rabbit. Don't pan anywhere. Keep the camera on me. The lab tech pans back to Ozzy, who continues. Miniaturization is achieved through the pairing of two 5,000 series photon echo memory chips called PEMS for short. 
The two chips are integrated but electronically opposed. Only one is necessary for miniaturization, but both are required for re-enlargement. A bell rings, horn sounds, lights flash. Zero minus 15, Oz. Keep rolling, I wanna record everything. Interior lab locker room. Tuck Pendleton is alone in, in the room. He wears a navy blue jumpsuit and sits on a bench with the same pensive expression of a football player before the big game. He rises, goes to a mirror over the sink, and looks at himself. The door bangs open and Ozzy enters. Startled, Tuck jumps at the noise. Nervous? Tuck makes no reply. Ozzy sees a bulge under Tuck's jumpsuit. Do you really need that? Tuck removes a flask from his pocket, pauses to consider it, then pours its contents down the sink. Okay. Ozzy nods his head, but then sees Tuck return the flask to his pocket. You're taking it anyway? I have to. My lucky flask. Ozzy sighs to himself in resignation. Okay. Now remember, trust your onboard computer. Use it. I know you've studied, but don't rely on yourself when you don't have to. The computer's been programmed to answer any questions you might have. I remember. Maybe we should review our objectives one more time. I know what our objectives are. Retrieve tissue samples and test efficiency of surgical laser beam. Look, Oz, I know I'm no prize, but I'm the only one you could get. And this mission's the only one I could get. Let's just get the job done. Zero minus 10. Interior corridor leading to lab. Tuck and Ozzy come down the corridor. Tuck holds his helmet under his arm. He looks like he's walking the last mile. The corridor is lined with boxes of 3D Action Man games. Many of them stamp Return for Refund or Defective or Discontinued Series. Tuck glances at the boxes. It shakes his confidence. Ozzy sees this. The game works. It's not my fault the public lost interest in video. They round a bend in the corridor and emerge into the lab. Buzzing with activity, technicians man their stations. Zero minus eight. Tuck and Ozzy approach the geodesic dome. It looms up for Tuck like the Matterhorn. Something catches in his throat. His heart skips a beat. They draw closer and closer to the dome. Inside the dome, Tuck and Ozzy enter, followed by several lab techs. In contrast to the lab without, the dome is clean and orderly. Its translucent panels gently diffuse the light. Tuck's eyes lead us to the pod, resting on a platform several feet above the floor. A graceful, molded, teardrop-shaped white fiberglass submersible chamber with stabilizers, rotors, thrusters, top-mounted floodlights, and articulating arms. An expansive glass viewing dome wraps around the pod's cockpit. Tuck approaches the pod. Good luck, Captain. A technician opens the pod's hatch and Tuck climbs in. Get me home before my air runs out. Don't worry, you've got a 24-hour supply. Zero minus five. The hatch is closed and locked. Mission control is a panel of monitors and terminals outside the dome. Ozzy takes his place behind the main controls. Dr. Niles and Mr. Blanchard aren't here yet. That's just too bad. Do you read me, Captain? Inside the pod, Tuck straps himself into the body contoured swivel seat. He's surrounded by computer terminals, display monitors, switches, lights, and instruments. Loud and clear, Oz. Back to mission control. Zero minus three. Engage PEM number one. The first PEM, a chip no bigger than a postage stamp, is snapped into a complex circuit board. Several technicians using perfectly calibrated instruments must oversee its precise placement. PEM number one, functional. Engage PEM number two. The second PEM is snapped into place on a portable circuit module with the same care and precision as the first chip. The module is then inserted into an opening in the nose of the pod itself. PEM number two functional. Activate miniaturization sphere. The miniaturization sphere, resembling a giant fishbowl made of smoked glass, descends from the top of the dome and is slowly lowered into place over the pod. Inside the pod, Tuck watches the dark sphere slowly engulf him, shutting out all but the brightest laboratory lights. He switches on the pod's interior lights. They glow with a soft green luminescence. Zero minus one and counting. Dissolve two. Close on Bugs, the laboratory white rabbit. Wires from several terminals embedded under its skin connect to monitors and display screens. Bugs' nose twitches nervously. 15 seconds, 14 seconds, 13 seconds. 
full shot of the lab, the atmosphere is charged with a sense of purpose, dedication, and the adventure of true scientific discovery. Two seconds. One second. Zero seconds. Ozzy presses a, presses a flashing yellow button, and the miniaturization sphere begins to glow brightly. The pod it's inside becomes a brilliant silhouette. Ultra-high-powered laser tubes bombard the sphere with beams of multicolored light. Inside the pod, Tuck wears a green visored helmet to protect his eyes from the blazing light. Close on various monitors, four different 3D images of the pod are displayed. A wireframe image, a solid model image, an x-ray image, a heat generated image. In all four cases, it is very clear to us that the pod is decreasing in size. Back to scene. 20% reduction, 50% reduction, 75% reduction. We now have full reduction. Raise the sphere. The miniaturization sphere is raised and the pod has seemingly disappeared. Everyone breathes a communal sigh of relief as small congratulatory smiles are exchanged. Nice work team. Now let's get the pod into the syringe. Cut to a suburban shopping mall day. Muzak plays, shoppers stroll, teenagers hang out. Jack Putter goes up the escalator to the second level. Interior mall camera shop. A customer is exchanging several cameras. Now this one is fully automatic. Hmm. In the background, we see Jack walk by. Jack pauses to look into the window of a travel agency. Posters advertising Mexican cruises are featured. Jack enters the agency. Interior travel agency. Jack is seated next to the desk of a woman travel agent. Fun, romance, excitement, relaxation. I'll take relaxation. It's a cruise. You get them all. Uh, no excitement. Doctor's orders. But you're a single young man. What about romance? Um, as long as it isn't too exciting. Exterior vector scope lab. Several telephone utility trucks pull up and park in the parking lot. Telephone company repairmen pile out wearing hard hats and coveralls. Orange cones are placed on the ground around the truck. Close on orange cone as it is set down on the pavement. Somehow this innocent act conveys a strong feeling of malevolence. Interior lab, inside dome. A computer-operated robotic arm places a hypodermic syringe filled with pinkish fluid beneath the lens of a powerful scanning electron microscope. All technicians defer to Ozzy, who is accorded the first look. He enters the dome and peers through the binocular viewing eyepiece of the microscope. What he sees, the pod, floating in the pink solution, Tuck clearly visible at the helm of the craft. Tuck inside the pod, Looks out the viewing dome at the strangely shaped and colored globules that float past his pod. Holy shit. Oz, I think you did it, boy. I'm little. I'm shrunk right down to nothing. Interior entrance to Vectoscope Lab. A group of telephone company repairmen enter the lobby. Two security guards are there. One sits behind a security command station desk where 10 or more video monitors display different locations around the complex. What's the trouble, boys? Oh, no trouble! The guard looks puzzled, and the repairmen slip on gas masks in, in unison. Hey, what is this? The repairmen are suddenly holding what appear to be road flares. The flares produce a billowing purple smoke. The second guard reaches for his gun, but his movements wind down like slow motion. The repairmen, who we shall now call the intruders, toss the flares to the floor and enter the lab unmolested as the entrance lobby fills with purple smoke. Interior corridor of lab. The intruders stride down the corridor. Several of them begin to snap together automatic rifles as they go. Exterior lab parking lot. A black sedan pulls up and parks a short distance away from the telephone company trucks. Close on black sedan. Two men sit in front. A third sits alone in the back. His power window glides down. The man is Mr. Igo, steel blue eyes, short blonde hair, year-round tan, rugged physique. Igo looks like an alpine ski instructor with psychotic tendencies. Interior lab. The intruders enter. For a moment they go unnoticed by the busy lab techs. Then the flares are produced and thrown in all directions. One flare lands directly under the nose of the technicians as at the mission control panel. Purple smoke begins to swirl in the air. Technicians begin to protest, but very quickly their eyes glaze over, their movements slow, and their voices slur. Where's the chip? Over there. Get it. The chip is ripped from the circuit board. Intruder 1 walks towards the dome. 
Ozzy, inside the dome, can see the silhouette of the approaching intruder outside. His expression fills with alarm. Outside the dome, the intruder smiles to himself and unleashes a fusillade of gunfire at the dome. Inside the dome, Ozzy flinches as the plexiglass dome begins to disintegrate under the barrage of gunfire. Shattered pieces rain down on him. He crouches behind the big microscope for protection. Then, glancing up at the hypodermic syringe under the microscope's lens, he makes a decision. He grabs the syringe, kicks open the dome's hatchway, and makes a dash for it. Outside the dome, Ozzy emerges on the side away from the intruders. They don't see him. He stays low, holding a handkerchief to his nose and mouth, darts between a few large pieces of equipment, and escapes. The intruders, meanwhile, have the technicians lined up before them. They regard their captors with dopey, bewildered expressions, swaying drunkenly from side to side. An intruder takes the video tape camera from one of the techs. Uh, who are you? I'm your mother. The tech looks confused. He makes an effort to understand, to focus his eyes, and slowly the intruder transforms for him into the image of his mother, a sweet gray-haired old lady. Mom. But Mom is carrying an automatic rifle in her arms. She swings up the barrel. Mom? Close on weapons barrel, exploding into gunfire. Close on bugs, the white rabbit, twitching and trembling at the sounds. Exterior vectorscope labs. Ozzy emerges from a side door into the bright light of day. He stops, looks in all directions, then runs off. Interior of the black sedan. Igo sees Ozzy running across the parking lot in the distance toward a parked motorcycle. He hops on, kicks the starter. The engine roars up, he squeals out across the parking lot. Get him! Full shot, the vectorscope parking lot. Ozzy speeding off in the black sedan, burning rubber in an effort to catch up. Exterior street near lab, day. Ozzy zooms down the street, but the black sedan begins to gain on him. Now the black sedan pulls up beside him. The rear window lowers and an Uzi handgun is pointed at Ozzy. Ozzy sees the gun, reacts by making a sharp turn to the right. Tires squeal, dust flies, the black sedan speeds past. But now Ozzy finds himself traveling up a freeway off-ramp. He dodges several cars coming down the ramp, horns honk. The black sedan makes a sharp U-turn in the street, roars up the off-ramp in pursuit of Ozzy. An 18-wheeler barrels down the ramp. Its air horn sounds. The black sedan swerves, just missing a major head-on, and proceeds up the ramp. Exterior of the freeway, day. Ozzy shoots onto the freeway going 80 miles per hour in the wrong direction. He hugs the freeway's shoulder, but oncoming traffic speeds past him at 65 miles per hour, with only inches of daylight to spare. The black sedan is not far behind, also racing along the shoulder of the roadway. Interior of the black sedan. Of the three men inside, only Igo is without fear. Run him off the road. What? Run him off. Igo leans forward and takes charge of the steering wheel. He yanks hard to the right. The black sedan swings out into the first freeway traffic lane, side by side with Ozzy's motorcycle. Ozzy looks over, can't believe his eyes. The black sedan stays in the traffic lane. Fortunately, there are no opposing vehicles immediately approaching. Inside the black sedan, Igo yanks the wheel to the left. The black sedan swerves towards Ozzy. Ozzy gives the motorcycle the gas and it leaps forward. The black sedan's front bumper just grazes the cycle's rear fender. Ozzy almost loses control. The motorcycle swerves dangerously to one side. Camera moves in tight on the syringe, poking out from the pocket of Ozzy's lab coat. Interior of the pod. Tuck is being buffeted about mercilessly. He struggles with the pod's control sticks. Hey! What's going on out there, Ozzy? Exterior of the freeway, an oil tanker bears down on the black sedan. Both occupy the same traffic lane. Inside the black sedan, Igo's henchmen begin to whimper. Igo has control of the steering wheel. The oil tanker is getting closer and closer. Igo gnashes his teeth in frustration and reluctantly swerves back onto the freeway's shoulder behind Ozzy. The oil tanker whizzes past with only inches to spare. Inside the black sedan, all three men suddenly see a freeway call box dead ahead. Exterior of the freeway, Ozzy swerves to miss the call box. The black sedan breaks, skids and squeals, but can't stop in time. Bam! The call box is sheared off and goes flying over the sedan's roof. Ozzy speeds into the lead and exits the freeway, this time using an on-ramp to do so. The black sedan resumes its pursuit, barrels down the on-ramp. Exterior surface streets, day. Ozzy roars by, the black sedan soon follows. Exterior parking lot of suburban shopping mall, day. Ozzy turns into the parking lot, the black sedan does likewise. Overhead view of parking lot, the motorcycle is much more nimble and quick cutting in and out of parking lanes, leaving the black sedan in its dust. The black sedan stops. Igo jumps out, steadies his arm on the door frame, and aims his pistol. Bang! Ozzy's motorcycle flies out from under him, skids across the pavement, and crashes. 
but Ozzy gets to his feet and runs t uh, toward the mall entrance. Igo jumps back into the black sedan. The black sedan roars down the parking aisle, jumps the curb, and comes to rest directly in front of the mall entrance. Igo and his henchmen dash into the mall. Interior mall camera shop. The customer still has decided which camera to buy. The clerk begins to load film into one of them. The best thing to do is just to try it out. Interior mall travel agency. Jack shakes hands with the travel agent, then gets to his feet. Congratulations, Mr. Putter. Jack smiles uneasily. Well, I didn't think it'd be this expensive, but... Don't worry. You're going to have a wonderful time. Interior mall. Igo and his henchmen run into the mall. Igo screws a silencer onto the barrel of his pistol and looks in all directions. There! Ozzy is just barely glimpsed getting into the glass elevator to the second level. The doors are closing behind him. Igo swings up his pistol with lightning speed and fires. <laughs> Ozzy makes it on board the elevator. Igo and his henchmen hurry towards an escalator a short distance down the mall. Interior of the glass elevator. Ozzy is alone, his face ashen. Sweat beads on his forehead. His eyes look glazed. Something is very wrong. Interior second level of mall. Jack emerges from the travel agency, glancing down at his cruise brochures as he walks. He moves towards the elevator. Meanwhile, the customer and clerk step out of the camera shop. The customer holds the camera in his hand. Go ahead. Give it a try. Igo doesn't stand still in the escalator. He pushes past other shoppers in his hurry to reach the second level. Jack arrives at the elevator. The customer swings the camera around and, for the want of anything better to shoot, points it at Jack. How about that autofocus? The elevator door is open, and Ozzy stands there, <clears throat> tottering on rubber legs. Jack looks at him, is taken aback by his appearance. Then Ozzy pitches forward, and Jack catches him. Click. The customer captures the moment on film. Insert. Close on Ozzy's hand, holding the hypodermic syringe. His arms wrap around Jack's waist. And with his last dying breath, he injects the pink fluid into Jack's butt. The pod inside the syringe is thrusted powerfully forward with the equivalent force of 15 Gs as the pink fluid rushes around it. Tuck inside the pod is slammed back into his seat by the unexpected burst of speed. Unprepared for such a tremendous acceleration, he blacks out. Jack feels the sting of the needle. He tries to turn. The syringe drops to the floor, unseen by Jack. Shoppers begin to scream and shriek. The back of Ozzy's lab coat is soaked with blood. Jack lowers him gently to the floor as a crowd begins to gather. Igo arrives, sees that Ozzy is dead. Then he spots the empty syringe lying on the floor. In all the excitement, no one notices him pick it up and put it into his pocket. Do the henchmen have any trouble stealing the camera away from the distracted customer? Full shot of the mall. Everyone is rushing to the second level. Security guards come running. Igo and his henchmen are conspicuous in that they are the only ones walking in the opposite direction. Jack just stands there over Ozzy's body, wearing a bewildered expression on his face. Tuck inside the pod, unconscious, head slumped against his shoulder. Dissolve 2, exterior Ralph's Market, day. Jack's VW bug speeds into the parking lot. Interior Market, day. Buzzing with activity. Jack dashes in, pale and sweaty. Wormwood grabs him. Oh, what now? Another doctor's appointment? Sorry, Mr. Wormwood. You wouldn't believe what happened to me this morning. You're right. I wouldn't. Jack takes the apron and heads off. You're not on vacation yet, you know. Jack passes Wendy, checking on aisle two, or clerking on aisle two. Hi, Wendy. Jesus, you okay? Well, I... Because you look like shit. Jack cringes, tries to comb his hair with his fingers. Wormwood grabs the store PA system microphone. Check lane three is now open to all shoppers. Immediate service on aisle three. Five or six shoppers with overflowing carts uh, charge toward aisle three. A massive pileup is only nearly averted. Interior of the pod. Tuck begins to regain consciousness. His eyes open and focus slowly. He shakes the cobwebs from his head, then at the viewing dome. Tuck's POV through dome. A long, hollow tunnel filled with fluid, floating red and white donut-shaped globules. Blood cells. Note to read it. When picturing sequences inside the body, imagine the darkness of the ocean floor, the only source of light being the pod's own flood lamps. The effect is mysterious and claustrophobic, with the ever-present heartbeat reverberating in the distance. Return to Tuck. Mission Control, come in. Can you read me? What the hell's going on in here? I think I blacked out. Am I inside bugs or what? Come in, do you copy? Damn radio. 
Interior, Ralph's Market. Mrs. Mulrooney, looking just as Jack described her in his dream. Orange hair, harlequin sunglasses and all. Swings her cart into Jack's checkout lane. Jack sees her. He looks a little worried. Mrs. Mulrooney begins to pile her selections onto the conveyor belt. They move slowly toward Jack. Tuck inside the pod. Mission Control, if you can hear me, I'm going to try to restore radio contact by reactivating one of the electromagnetic booster cells. All right, here it comes, Oz. Hold on to your socks. Tuck hits the booster button. Exterior of the pod. Bzzz. A strong electromagnetic charge is emitted from the pod in the form of a brilliant blue light. Interior of the market, aisle three. The electromagnetic charge begins to play havoc with Jack's barcode scanner. The register begins to record inaccurate prices. 2500 for a loaf of bread. 6000 for a can of dog food. 1500 buys a box of Raisin Bran. Exterior of the pod. Bzz, bzz. Two more jolts of electromagnetic energy are emitted. This doesn't put radio transmission back online. Nothing will. Interior of the market, aisle three. Jack and everyone surrounding him have become aware of the computer glitch. The total on the register reads $128,000. Jack looks dazed. All color is drained from his face. The dream. It's the dream. The dream's come true. Wormwood arrives to take charge and glances at the register. Jack, what have you done? It's the dream. The what? Wendy comes over to look. Boy, Jack, way to screw up. Listen, sweetie, I don't carry that kind of cash around on me. The line rings bells in Jack's head. Then his eyes widen in horror as Mrs. Mulroney reaches inside her purse. Oh, no. Here comes the gun. But she only removes a pack of cigarettes and lights up. Jack breathes a deep sigh of relief and grabs his head. <gasps> oh, I need an aspirin. Please, thank you. I beg you for an aspirin. Unhand me, putter. In desperation, Jack grabs a bottle of bare aspirin from his Mrs. Mulrooney's purchases, pops off the top, discards the cotton, and puts the bottle to his lips as if to chug a lug the tablets. Hey, I'm not buying those aspirin now. At $800 a bottle? Who would want to? Laughter from other shoppers. Wormwood fumes. He rips the aspirin bottle from Jack's hand. Tablets go flying across the floor. Get a hold of yourself, Jack. You're coming unglued. You're coming apart at the seams. Jack stares back at Wormwood with a glazed, uncomprehending expression. Wormwood is alarmed. Oh my god, he's completely spaced out. I'll handle this. She steps forward and slaps Jack across the face with all of her might. Jack's head spins halfway around. Snap out of it, Jack! Interior of the pod. Tuck gives up on the radio. He leans back in his chair to think. Great. No radio, no communication. I'm completely cut off. Only I could see out. Hmm. Maybe I can. He turns to the computer and flips a number of switches. The computer begins to glow and hum. Uh, I said this thing can answer any question I have. Um, hey you, um, can I see through the eyes of this beast? Sounds like a plan, Stan. Tuck does a double take. Huh? We can patch into the optic nerve, intercept the electrical impulses going to the brain. Great. How do I find it? You want directions? Yeah. Say, didn't you prepare for this mission? Do I have to defend myself to a machine? Let's have the directions. Okay, okay. Keep your eye on the screen, player number one. Begin the first level. And good luck. Well, it's built out of an old video game. The computer tunes up like an arcade game, and the monitor begins to display the map Tuck needs. Take radial artery to auxiliary artery to the internal jugular vein to the frontal sinus to... Interior market, Wormwood's office day. Jack sits in a chair, recovering. He rests one arm on Wormwood's desk. Wormwood stands over him. I know I lost my temper, Jack. I'm sorry. You've been like a son to me. Uh, well, a nephew, anyway. You've got a big future in retail food marketing, and I'd hate to see you blow it now by going psycho on us. Wendy enters with a cup of coffee. Jack looks up and smiles appreciatively. Coffee! Great, Wendy. That's just what I need. But Wendy didn't bring it for Jack. She sips it herself. There's more down the hall if you want some. 
Jack just shakes his head, resigned to her indifference. Jack, go home, get some rest. Start your vacation today and come back to us a new man. Okay, um, thanks, Mr. Wormwood. Jack rises from his chair, discovers that the arm he was resting on Wormwood's desk is covered with paper clips. Jack looks puzzled. He tries to brush them off, but can't. God, Jack, now what? Suddenly, Wendy's metal coffee spoon flies out of her hand and sticks to Jack's chest with a resounding thud. Wormwood pries it off, and it snaps right back. Good lord, the guy's a living magnet! Tuck inside the pod begins to get a picture on the computer's display monitor. All right, I'm getting a picture here. Close on monitor as it begins to broadcast Jack's POV, which at this moment consists of Wendy and Wormwood looking at him with astonished expressions. Of course, there is no sound. Wait a minute, who the hell are they? And where am I? Jack in the office lifts his arm to look at the paper clips that cling to it. Tuck inside the pod sees the human arm come into view, and he realizes that... I'm a man. Son of a bitch, I'm in a strange man, surrounded by strangers in a strange room. How did I get inside a man? What, what happened to a rabbit? I started up on rabbits. What the? Okay, Tuck. Grip on yourself. You have a snafu here, as we say in the military. Damn, why did I pour that scotch down the sink? Okay, okay. <clears throat> sink clear, stay cool. Tuck takes a moment to consider his options, then springs into action. I'll talk to the guy. Uh, I need directions to the inner ear. Oh, so now it's the ear you want? Yes, now, right now. Okay, player number one, it's your quarter. Interior Jack's inner ear. The pod floats into the middle ear, an enormous glistening cavity that dwarfs the pod. The pod's articulating arms fasten a small electronic device to the eardrum. Interior Jack's VW bug traveling day. Jack behind the wheel. He feels a strange sensation in his ear. It tickles. He shakes his head, then scratches his ear with a finger. Exterior self-serve gas station day. Jack fills his VW's tank. Nearby, two 13-year-old boys put air into their bike tires. The young station attendant leans against a pump drinking a Coke. Hello? Jack turns towards the boys, sees that they are occupied in a task. He shrugs it off. If you can hear me. Jack now turns towards the attendant. You talking to me? The attendant just gives Jack a blank look and continues to sip his Coke. <laughs> it works! I can hear you! Jack turns fast towards the boys. Okay, fellas. What's the joke? Huh? No joke. Jack looks startled. The voice is not coming from the boys at all. He turns back towards the attendant. You! Me? What? It's you! Yeah, it's me, all right. I've been me all my life. The boys laugh. The attendant trades a look with them. Jack is befuddled. Look, I'm not out there. I'm in here. In here? Where's it here? In you, in your body. Look, they put me in you instead of a rabbit. Why'd they do that? Jack can't believe what he's hearing. A lunatic smile of madness registers on his face, and he lets out a shriek of hysterical laughter. <laughs> now the attendant looks alarmed. <laughs> you okay, fella? Yes, of course. However, I apparently just got insane. <laughs> he jumps back into his car and squeals away. Interior of the pod. Traveling down the external auditory canal toward the external ear opening. Hey, pal, how come I get the sinking feeling that you don't know what's going on any more than I do? Interior Dr. Greenbush's office. Jack, looking very agitated, sits on the examination table. Greenbush approaches him. A little uh, voice inside your ear, huh? Okay, Jack. Let's take a look and see. Greenbush raises his ear exam flashlight to Jack's ear. Interior of the pod. A brilliant, searing light streams into the ear canal with blinding intensity. Tuck screams and grabs his eyes in pain. Oh, God! <clears throat> Interior Greenbush's office. Greenbush withdraws the instrument from Jack's ear. I didn't see anything, Jack. Why don't you just go home and try and get some rest? Interior of the pod. Tuck takes his hands away from his eyes. He looks around with a vacant expression. 
Exterior of Jack's apartment building, day. Jack's VW swings into the parking area of a small apartment complex. Interior of Jack's apartment. Jack enters and collapses into an easy chair in exhaustion. He takes a few deep breaths and tries to forget the day's traumatic events. His eyes begin to close when... Ah! I can see! Jack leaps from his chair, back to Tuck inside the pod. Oh, thank God! I was just getting ready to kiss my pilot's license goodbye. Oh. Jack, inside the apartment, stands in the middle of the room, poised for an attack from any direction. Where are you? Who are you? Jack, we got ourselves a little situation here. You know my name? I heard somebody call you that right before the lights went out, so to speak. Jack rubs his temples. Stay calm, Jack. Mm -hmm. Don't panic. Take your doctor's advice. Get some rest. Jack charges into the bathroom, where he throws open the medicine cabinet and begins to rummage through the bottles. He finds one, looks at it. Tuck, inside the pod, sees the bottle's label. Sleeping pills? Back to Jack in the bathroom. <laughs> Anybody knows what I'm doing? Hey, those? I'm, I'm going to sleep. For a little while, not long, to say two or three days, and when I wake up, if you're not gone, hey, no, listen to me. You're, you're not crazy. I'm real, and I only got a 24-hour air flight to begin with. So please don't go to sleep on me. Jack pops the pills into his mouth. Too late. Back to Tuck inside the pod. Oh, you fall, oh, man! Oh, if this was a normal size, and now it's outside even set of in, I'd hit you so hard your grandchildren would be wearing broken noses. Okay, uh, quick, give me the fastest way to the stomach. The stomach? Ugh. Jack in the bathroom stares into his medicine cabinet mirror, as if searching his reflection for some clue to his sudden insanity. Then it hits him. No more voice. Voice? Are you still there? No reply. Jack seems pleased. Interior Jack's stomach. The pod rips into the stomach through the convoluted folds of the stomach wall. Interior the pod. We share Tuck's view through the dome as the pod hurtles into the foaming torrent of the stomach. The gastric glands secrete their caustic juices and hydrochloric acid bubbles up in all directions. Here come the sleeping pills. Huge gelatin capsules filled with multicolored granules. They tumble down into the stomach headed straight for the pod. Tuck swings a laser gun sighting device into position. He takes aim and fires. Direct hits. The capsules vaporize on the spot, exploding into colorful gas balls. Interior of the living room. Jack enters. But he stops to rub his stomach. He feels a queasy sensation down there. He lies down on the sofa to rest. You jackass, you trying to kill us both? How many of those pills did you take? Oh no, it's back. You bet I'm back. Jack puts his hands over his ears. <laughs> I'm not listening to you. Please. Jack begins to hum to himself to cover Tuck's voice. We have to talk. I think I'll watch some TV now. No, you won't. Ha! Try and stop me! Jack picks up the remote control and turns on the TV. Tuck, inside the pod, hits the electromagnetic booster button, and the television shuts off. Jack turns it on again, but again, Tuck turns it off. Jack turns it on again, Tuck turns it off. On, off, on, off, on, off. Okay, we got the TV, okay. Tuck, inside the pod, he's really pissed off now. No, no, watch TV, watch TV, you enjoy yourself. Tuck holds down both electromagnetic buttons. In the living room, a flash of blinding white light. The TV comes on full volume. The channels begin to change faster and faster. The picture is just a blur. The indoor antenna shoots out to its longest extension and begins to whip around the air like a scorpion's tail. The volume grows louder and louder. The TV bangs up and down on the table. Jack watches all this with stunned, open-mouthed horror, then popping and hissing. Oh, no! The TV explodes. The sofa is blown over backwards, and Jack goes flying with it. Jack lies there on the rug, breathing heavily. Tuck inside the pod is also out of breath. Jack and Tuck are like two fighters who have pummeled each other into total exhaustion, but are both unwilling to concede defeat. I think we've really gotten this relationship off on the wrong foot. Jack, lying on the rug, makes no reply. He just tries to catch his breath. I'm real, Jack. You do believe that now, don't you? I, uh, I want to believe it, Jack, because it's true. Did you ever see that movie where uh, Tony Curtis and Sidney Poitier are handcuffed together? Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, that's us, Jack. That's us?
Uh, back to Tuck inside the pod. We're in this together and we have to help each other. You don't work at the lab, do you? I work at Ralph's Market. You don't know anything about the experiment, do you? What experiment? Shit. Jack, my name is Pendleton. Tuck Pendleton, uh, Captain United States Navy. I'm involved in a miniaturization experiment. I was supposed to be placed inside a rabbit, but somehow I got inside you instead. Jack rests his forehead against the wall. Wow, what a day I'm having. <laughs> Interior car traveling day. Uh, Dr. David Niles is behind the wheel. His passenger is Pete Blanchard. We're late. We've missed the best part of the experiment. Relax, would you? By the way, uh, who's your guy? Huh? Your pilot, your guy inside the pod. Oh, somebody you know, I think. Captain Tuck Pendleton. Blanchard gives Niles a look of disbelief. Pendleton? Yeah, what's wrong? Oh, nothing, except Tuck Pendleton's got the worst attitude problem in the military history. He's been drummed out of every space program since Gemini, and he drinks like a fish. However, the dumb son of a bitch did save my life. Niles gives Blanchard a look. He pulled me out of my space capsule when it caught fire on the pad. Of course, the only reason he got to me so fast was because he had to sneak into a restricted area where he wasn't allowed. Exterior docks of San Francisco, day. I goes dented and battered black sedan is parked next to a large but inconspicuous looking warehouse. Inside the warehouse, it's actually a scientific laboratory. Why beat around the bush? This is the bad guy's secret lab, and some of the bad guys are currently present. I go and his henchmen, uh, several lab techs, and Dr. Margaret Kanker, an unusually glamorous looking scientist. They are all gathered around a TV monitor watching the videotape made of the miniaturization experiment. There's two chips. It's a uh, dual chip system. We have one. Where's the other? In the pod. But where's the pod? Just then, another lab tech shows up with some enlarged photos from the camera taken from the camera shop customer. The first enlargement shows the hypodermic needle actually entering Jack's backside. The second enlargement shows Jack's face. The pod's in him. Kanker looks at the photo of Jack, then turns to Igo. Find him. Exterior Vectorscope Labs parking lot day. Police cars with whirling red bubble lights, ambulances, coroner's vans, a crowd of onlookers, police officers holding them back, setting up barricades, TV news crews arriving. Jack shoulders his way to the very front of the crowd. He gets there just in time to see bodies draped in white sheets being wheeled from the lab on gurneys to waiting ambulances and coroner's vans. Tuck inside the pod views the situation on his monitor, his expression registering horror and alarm. Exterior of the parking lot, Jack tries to stop a policeman. Officer, excuse me, officer, what's going on? Get back, stay back. The policeman hurries off. Did you hear that? Yeah, give me a minute to think. Exterior entrance to lab. Newspaper reporters and TV crews have been allowed past the police line. One of these reporters is Lydia. She muscles her way up to Pete Blanchard, who is emerging from the building. Pete, there's a few questions. I have nothing to say, Lydia. Isn't it true that Victor Scope Laboratories was working on a secret satellite missile tracking system for the Defense Department? That's absolutely untrue. And you can't quote me, and you can quote me on that. Get the press back. The police do as instructed, herding the press back behind police lines. Lydia is forced back, and she finds herself standing directly in front of Jack, who is, of course, a total stranger to her. Jack's nose is within inches of Lydia's hair. Tuck inside the pod smells something strange coming in through his air vents. He sniffs, then turns the air jet so that they shoot directly at his face. He sniffs again. Night, ladies. Then he sees something on his monitor. Dr. Niles hurrying past. Dr. Niles. Hey, a follow that short guy with the curly hair and glasses. Jack in the parking lot begins to move through the crowd, trying to keep up with Niles, who is on the other side of the police barricade. Who is he? 
He runs the lab. Don't let him out of your sight. You can just talk to him. I lost him. Niles ducks into his parked car and slams the door behind him. Tuck inside the pod views the scene on his monitor. All right, look, he's not driving off. There's someone in the car with him. Is this as close as you can get? Jack is about 30 yards away from the parked car. A crush of onlookers surrounds him. Yeah. All right, keep looking at the car. Why? Tuck inside the pod begins to make some frantic adjust adjustments to the dials on its consoles. Okay, look directly at them. Don't turn your head. We can beef up the reception a little. Suddenly, Niles' voice is heard loud and clear over the pod speakers. My God, what happened in there? That's it. Jack looks startled. Hey, I can hear them. Tell them to shut up and listen. Interior car. You've been hit good. Professional work. Who'd want to do this to you? Why, anybody. Or any country that wants to leapfrog a decade's worth of research. Blanchard looks very distressed. I hope you know that we can't get, can't get involved in this. You're on your own now. Tuck, inside the pod, reacts to the sound of Blanchard's voice. He looks closely at his monitor, but sun glares off the car's windshield, hiding Blanchard's face. Oh, that voice. Interior car. We've got to keep our hands clean. This is your baby. You change the diapers. But what about Pendleton? What about him? He's out there somewhere. Pendleton's been around the military long enough to know that every mission contains an element of risk. He saved your life once. Tuck inside the pod. Pete Blanchard. Interior of the car. There's nothing we can do to help Pendleton now. The chip's gone and his air supply runs out. Almost 20 hours. Start the car. Get me out of here. Jack watches as Blanchard and Niles drive away. Sounds like you're being kissed off. Tuck inside the pod is silent, but the expression of betrayal he wears speaks volumes. Exterior vector scope parking lot. Lydia returns to her car where her colleague, uh, Dwayne Flournoy, a well-dressed black man, is waiting. Dwayne stands outside the car, holding the business end of the car's shortwave radio in his hand. Well? Blanchard's stonewalling. He knows more than he's telling. Guess who's arriving at the airport in exactly four hours? The cowboy? You got it. Got it. Yes. Lydia smiles knowingly, glances back at the vectorscope lab, then turns to face Dwayne again. The pieces are beginning to fall in place. Interior first class cabin of 747 day. We hear the hum of the engines. Camera moves down aisle, eventually discovers a pair of snakeskin uh, cowboy boots. Hang on a second. Uh, cowboy boots. Camera pans up, taking in blue jeans, suede western sports coat, bib front shirt, and felt Stetson hat. This is the cowboy. But despite his name and his dress, his looks are distinctly foreign. Prominent nose and cheekbones, pointy chin and dark, bushy eyebrows. He reads what looks to be the Arabic version of People magazine. Interior Jack's VW traveling with Jack behind the wheel. Well, Jack, we're on our own. What can I do? Help me get that other chip back. Jack looks miserable. This is really bad timing. I, mean, I just got a few extra days vacation and on Monday I'm supposed to leave on a cruise. Back to tuck inside the pod. Gee, Jack, how thoughtless of me. All right, look, you heard the guy. I got, I got 24 hours of air left. I wouldn't worry about missing your cruise. Back to Jack driving. You know, that, that isn't much time. Gosh, you're right. Why didn't I think of that? I mean, what happens if we fail? What happens if we don't, we don't get the ship back and your air supply runs out? What happens then? your eyes submersible pod floating around your insides with a tiny little human skeleton at the helm. Ah! Not a pretty thought, is it? Jack begins no. to bang his head against the steering wheel. Tuck inside the pod is also being rocked back and forth by Jack's head movement. And Tuck's head is slammed against the console a few times as well. Interior Jack's apartment. Jack enters, glances at the exploded TV, then heads towards the kitchen. I need some aspirin. My head is killing me. Maybe it's allergies. Tuck inside the pod rubs his own battered forehead. Hanging out against the steering wheel. 
Jack picks up the aspirin bottle from the counter and fills a glass with water when a knock is heard at the door. What's that? The door. Be careful. Jack opens the door to find a messenger standing there. Mr. Jack Putter? Um, yeah. Uh, from from World Tour Tour Travel. Uh, yeah. Jack looks puzzled. Cruise tickets, I think. Sign on number 12. Mind if, you, mind if I use your phone? Gotta call my dispatcher. Oh, well. Okay, sure. The messenger comes in and sees the exploded TV. Shout out your TV, huh, man? Just like Elvis. Jack doesn't respond. He just points out the phone. The messenger picks it up and dials. Lucky man. Going on a cruise. What about your roommate? Roommate? I thought I heard you talking to somebody as I came to the door. No, I live here alone. Back to Tuck inside the pod. Don't trust him. He's not a messenger. Jack turns his back on the messenger. Hey, you know. I got a gut reaction called a survival instinct. Get out now. Jack turns back towards the messenger who is talking into the phone. Okay, I made the drop. Everything is cool. The messenger hangs up the phone, sees that Jack is looking at him strangely. Jack glances at the door. The messenger grows suspicious. Jack makes a dash for the door. The messenger draws a gun and leaps after him. But the throw rug slides out from beneath the messenger's feet and the messenger goes flying. Jack swings open the door. It connects with the messenger's head and the messenger thuds unconscious to the floor, the gun still clutched in his hand. Uh, exterior apartment courtyard day. Jack runs from the apartment into the courtyard. This is what he sees. Three men in dark business suits entering the courtyard. One of the men is Igo. Jack ducks behind a palm tree out of sight. Igo and his two henchmen pass by, heading for Jack's apartment. When safe, Jack runs off. Exterior apartment parking area day. Jack runs into the parking area but stops short. One of Igo's henchmen is standing guard over his VW. Jack steps back into the shadow of a garbage dumpster. They're watching my car. Go to a payphone. Call a cab. Where, where am I going? How, how am I going to pay for it? If you're going to my place, you can pay the cabbie when you get there. My treat. Interior tux house day. Jack looks around. Nice place. What a dump. I heard that. Man, you're right. I could use a drink, Jack. Bet you could, too. Um, I don't drink. Well, I do. See if there's a bottle of cutty under the sofa cushion, would you? Jack makes a face, but takes a look. Nope, the other cushion. Oh. On Tuck's video, we see Jack's hands flip over the cushion and find the bottle. Got it. Tuck is licking his lips. Hey, here's what I want you to do. Take a nice big tug on that baby, and I'll see what I can catch on the way down. How? Don't let me worry about that. Exterior of the pod. One of the pod's articulating arms extends out from the pod's body with a soft mechanical whirring sound. Clutched in the arm's claw is Tuck's empty flask. Inside the pod, Tuck looks out the viewing dome to make sure arm and flask are properly in place. Okay, Jack. Down the hat. I'm not much of a drinker. Come on. Let her rip. Then a tidal wave of amber liquid splashes down from above and crashes against the pod. The pod rolls over and over in the thundering alcohol current. Finally, it comes to rest in some dark vestibular channel of Jack's digestive system. Tuck presses a few buttons and the articulating arm begins to retract into the pod. Claw and flask slide into the pod through an airlock opening. Come on, lucky flask! Tuck eagerly grabs the flask and sloshes it around under his nose. His expression sours. Yeah. Sounds a little strange. It's a shade green. Oh well. Probably just some harmless biochemical waste material. Then a drop splashes out onto his jumpsuit, hissing and burning a small hole in the fabric. Mixed with a bit of stomach acid? Yeah, what the hell? Rock gut whiskey's better than none at all. Cheers! He throws back a drink, his eyes fill with tears, and he gasps for air. He begins to pound his fist against the <laughs> console, and he makes a full spin in his swivel chair. That's 
strong enough to grow hair on a snake. Chuck takes another belt. Jack almost seems pleased by what has just passed his lips. He looks at the bottle's label, shrugs his shoulders, and takes another drink. Chuck, inside the pod, really feels relaxed. He rummages around and eventually finds what he's looking for, an audio cassette. Close on the cassette, Sam Cooke's greatest hits. Tuck inserts the tape into a player and kicks back. Like a little cutty and Sam Cooke to chase away the miseries of the day. Yeah. Exterior street day. The black sedan carrying Igo and his henchman roars by. Interior black sedan. Igo sits in the back seat wearing an expression of stony resolution. The car presses on relentlessly. Interior pod. Rocking to the music of Sam Cooke's twisting the night away. Tuck leans back, flask in hand, foot tapping against the console. Here's a man in evening clothes. How he got there, I don't know. But man, you ought to see him go. Twisting the night away. Jack is lip syncing to the song and twisting his heart out. He's infused with the spirit of the music and perhaps with the spirit of the cutty as well. Lean up. I lean back. Then the night away. Tuck inside the pod. Hey, Jack! What? Why? I don't know what the hell you look like. Jack turns and looks for a mirror. Uh, he sees one on the wall, he staggers over to it. Tuck inside the pod can tell by looking into his monitor that Jack is weaving from side to side. Hey, you're not drunk, are you? No, I was just a little dizzy. And only after one stinking drink. Jack approaches the mirror. He looks at the cutty bottle in his hand. It's almost half empty. More than one drink, I think. How's this? Tuck inside the pod sees in his monitor Jack's face as it is reflected in the mirror. But Jack is way too close, creating a distorted fisheye look. Yeah, too close. Back up. Back up. Jack does. That's better. For a moment, Tuck just looks at the face of the man whose body he inhabits. Then he turns off the music. Jack, I guess you realize some really serious bad guys are after you because of me. So when you want to bail out, I understand. Just sneeze me into a Kleenex or something and hand me over to him. Jack stares into the mirror with a besotted expression. Didn't you just save my life? When? You warned me about that phony messenger. Well, yeah, I, mean, I guess I did, but... So just shut up about the Kleenex. Tuck inside the pod realizes the Jack in his own way is saying he won't quit. Tuck has moved. Thanks, Jack. Jack turns away from the mirror, embarrassed. But let's face it. We need help. Can you drive? Is your head clear? Well, uh... Slap yourself in the face. Huh? In the face. Slap yourself. Whack. Jack does. Uh, Jack does it harder. Jack does it again. Oh, uh, one more time. Whack. Jack does it one more time. Hey, how's it feel now? Feels good. Uh, exterior Tuck's house, the garage door, day. We hear it before we see it, the full-throated roar of its 12-cylinder, 4.4-liter engine. The garage door swings up, swings up, revealing a fire-engine red 1969 Ferrari Daytona. One of the most awesome road machines ever produced. Jack is behind the wheel. He just touches the gas pedal, and the car rockets out of the garage. Exterior road, day. Jack squeals around the hairpin curves, leading away from Tuck's hillside house. Are you sure you're sober? Suddenly, Igo's black sedan barrels around the bend towards them. The Ferrari crosses the center line. Jack screams and yanks on the wheel. The black sedan skids off the road and onto the shoulder in a cloud of dust. It's over now! Interior, the black sedan. It was them. Turn around. Turn around! But the sedan is stalled, and now the engine falls, uh, fails to turn over. It groans uncooperatively. I hate this black sedan. I want a new black sedan. I want a Mercedes-Benz 500 SEL. Yes, Mr. Igo. Then the engine fires up, sputters, and the car lurches into gear. 
Exterior freeway day. The Ferrari barrels along. Jack clutches the steering wheel with both hands as if the car might speed out from under him. Interior of the pod. Uh, Tuck has his eyes glued to the monitor, which displays Jack's POV of the freeway, etc. Watch out for the truck up ahead. Look, change lanes. Get the fast lane. Wait. Not now. Okay. Now. Wait. Watch your, watch your tachometer. Fifth. Clutch. Always shift to 4,500 4, RPMs. Keep it on the temperature gauge. Boy, you're talking about a backseat driver. We're coming a classic. It's the only thing I own that's worth a shit. Back to Jack and the Ferrari. Maybe you should tell me where I'm going. I'm gonna look up a friend of mine. Interior, newspaper press room, day. Dwayne Florney is at his desk talking with the city editor. Lydia practically flies by. I'm off, Dwayne. Hey, Lydia, wait a minute. Where are you going? Airport. What about this vector scope story? I'm playing a hunch, Gus. It's gonna be big, Gus. Hey, who do you two think you are, anyway? Redford and Newman? Lydia does a double take. I think you mean Woodward and Bernstein, Chief. Lydia disappears out the door. Exterior of the street, day. Lydia emerges from the newspaper building and heads for her car parked at the curb. At the same moment, Jack and Tuck in the red Ferrari come down the street. Interior of the Ferrari. That's her! Where? I saw her in the corner of your eye. Jack looks around. Getting into her car. Hurry, she'll get away. Honk the horn. Jack hits the horn. It has a very distinctive sound. Lydia turns and looks in Jack's direction. Close on Lydia. Sunlight glistens off her copper-colored hair. She looks beautiful. Close on Jack. Immediately smitten. Exterior of the street. Lydia marches up to the parked Ferrari. She comes. Lydia arrives at the car. Jack opens his mouth to speak, but doesn't get a chance. I know this car. This car belongs to Tuck Pendleton. What are you doing with Tuck Pendleton's car? Tuck wants to know to trust somebody with his life than his Ferrari. How'd you get this car? Who are you anyway? Does Tuck know you have his car? Tuck inside the pod. Lydia, shut up and listen. Jack in the Ferrari. Lydia, shut up and listen. Lydia looks shocked. Jack wants to eat his words. The black sedan pulls up to the curb across the street from where Jack and Lydia are talking. Igo and his henchmen pile out. One henchman slams the door on Igo's hand. Igo doesn't even flinch. He just looks down at his hand. All five fingers are caught in the tightly closed door. The guilty henchman looks worried for his own safety, but Igo calmly opens the door and pulls his hand free. Jack catches sight of Igo and the henchman, who are prevented from crossing the street by heavy traffic. Oh no, it's them! Lydia looks up with a quizzical expression. Hop in. Lydia hesitates. Hop in, talks in trouble, he needs your help! Lydia takes a chance. She jumps in beside Jack, and the Ferrari squeals away from the curb. Back to Tuck inside the pod. Oh, that a girl, Lydia! I go on the street, signals his men back into the black sedan. Exterior of the street. The Ferrari only gets one block before it must stop at a red light. Jack bangs his fist against the steering wheel. Who are those men? Bad guys. Very bad guys. The black sedan also comes to a stop, about ten cars back. It's a long light, and Jack is getting nervous. He glances over his shoulder. Igo and his henchmen decide to leave their sedan and rush Jack on foot. They race up the line of stopped vehicles and get within a car's length of the Ferrari when blink, the light turns green. The Ferrari squeals through the intersection, burning rubber. Igo and his henchmen turn and run back towards the black sedan. Igo gets there first. He doesn't bother to wait for the others. He slides in behind the wheel and zooms away. The henchmen are left standing in the street. Interior of the Ferrari, speeding down a city street. Jack glances into the rear view for glimpses of the black sedan. I don't see him. Uh, I think we gave him a slip. Exterior busy intersection day. The black sedan is stalled in the middle of the intersection, causing a major traffic jam. Horns honk madly. Igo jumps from the car and slams the door in anger. He then looks around, wrestles a bicycle away from an old Chinese person, and pedals off in pursuit of Jack. Interior Chinatown restaurant day. Lydia and Jack at one of the tables. You might say Tuck's been taken hostage. Who has him? Um, that's a little hard to explain. Um, we need something called a PEM to, to get him back. Uh, it's a microchip. It was taken from, uh, was it Vectorscope Lab this morning? <gasps> Vectorscope! Everything's coming up Vectorscope today. Have you gone to the police? There's no time for long explanations or police reports. Um, as a matter of fact, we only have... 
Tuck inside the pod checks his air supply gauge. 16 hours. Back to Jack inside the restaurant. 16 hours. 16 hours? Can we negotiate for more time? Not a chance. Jack begins to squirm uncomfortably in his seat. What's the matter? Um, I gotta pee real bad. Mm. Lydia looks aghast. Jack freaks. I can't believe I said that. Exterior of the restaurant day. Igo pedals up to the restaurant. He sees the parked Ferrari and smiles to himself. He discards the bike and approaches the restaurant. Interior restaurant restroom. Jack stands before the urinal relieving himself. Another restaurant customer washes his hands at the sink. Didn't tell me she was going to be so beautiful. The customer at the sink glances over at Jack. You think so? Absolutely. I think we should tell her the truth, too. Again, the customer looks over in Jack's direction, sees him looking down into the urinal, talking softly. Who would believe it? Besides, it's humiliating being this small. There, I've said it. What's so bad about being small? The customer now comes up behind you. Uh, play with it, pal, but don't talk to it. With that, the customer exits the restroom, and Jack looks mortified. Who is that? Never mind. Jack flushes the urinal and watches the water swirl down the drain. Uh, are you still there? Yeah, why? Oh, just, just checking. Interior of the restaurant. Jack emerges from the restroom and approaches the table. We see Jack's POV as he moves towards Lydia. Lydia looks up and registers alarm. She rises from her chair and draws what appears to be a gun from her purse and takes aim seemingly at Jack. Freeze! Restaurant patrons scream and take cover under tables. Jack stands there frozen in horror. Then he looks behind him and sees Igo, who stops in his tracks and slowly raises his hands above his head. Tuck inside the pod. Igo's face appears on his display monitor. Then the picture suddenly scrambles. All the instruments begin to go haywire. Needles on gauges spin, lights flash, radio reception buzzes. Tuck doesn't know which problem to attend to first. Full shot of the restaurant. Lydia has the drop on Igo. This is an electric stun gun, a non-lethal personal defense weapon employing a charge of 5,000 volts. It will immobilize you for up to 20 minutes and, in all probability, rendered you unconscious as well. So, don't take one, don't take one step closer. Igo looks at the gun, an expression of abject terror on his face. Call the police! Igo suddenly grabs Jack. No! She squeezes back on the trigger. A stun dart shoots out from the weapon. Igo uses Jack as a shield, and the dart hits Jack. Close on Jack's market name tag. The dart penetrates the plastic name tag, melting it instantly and releasing half its charge with a loud bzzz. The other 2,500 volts enter Jack's body, and Jack goes limp in Igo's arms. Tuck inside the pod also feels the impact of the electrical charge. Crackling ribbons of electric current dance around the contours of the pod. Tuck is slammed back into his seat as electricity courses through his limbs. The pod's lights dim, then brightens once again. But Tuck has left a shaken man. His hair sticks straight up in current punker fashion, and his head glows from within like a jack-o'-lantern. Tuck's consciousness returns when the pod is suddenly turned upside down as I go in the restaurant picks up Jack's limp body and tosses it over his shoulder like a sack of flour. Igo runs from the restaurant amid an uproar of yelling and screaming. God, someone call the police! As Igo runs off, the Ferrari keys slip from Jack's pocket and fall to the floor. Lydia sees this and snatches them up. Exterior alley behind restaurant day. Igo runs down the alley with Jack over his shoulder. Jack begins to snap out of it. He can't imagine where he is or why he's being conveyed this way. We also see that he too sports an electrified punk hairdo. Igo notices a delivery truck pulling away from a loading dock. He's able to pop open the cargo doors and throw Jack inside. But now the truck is driving away. Igo runs alongside of it. It begins to pick up speed. Igo keeps up with it, leaps onto a running board, throws open the cab door, yanks out the driver, and takes his place behind the wheel. The truck thunders down the alley at top speed. Tuck, inside the pod, is grateful to see his instruments come back online. The pod is righted once again, its speed and direction under control. Jack! Jack, are you all right? What happened? It seemed like we had a massive power surge. No response from Jack. Tuck looks concerned. Uh, he glances at one of his gauges in alarm. Hold on, Jack. Your heart rate's going way, way down. I'm... Jack! 
Oh, you had me worried. I thought I lost you there for a minute, kid. Where's Lydia? Where are we? See a thing. Why is it so dark? <laughs> Can't make it out, Jack. Your message is garbled. Try again. I. Freezing. Freezing. Exterior of the delivery truck. Traveling day. I go behind the wheel. Camera pans to the sign lettered on truck side. It reads Bay Area Frozen Food Supply Company. Jack, what's that loud tapping sound? Interior of truck's cargo area. Close on Jack's teeth. Chattering loudly. The tapping sound heard by Tuck. Camera pulls back to reveal Jack huddled in the corner among the boxes of frozen foods. His entire body shaking beneath a thin layer of frost. His punk hair spikes looking like inverted icicles. Exterior secluded spot beneath the Golden Gate Bridge. Day. The frozen food truck is parked. A limo rolls up beside it. Henchmen rush to open the back door and Victor Scrimshaw slides out. Scrimshaw's dress and demeanor suggest a man of near limitless power. Interior cargo area of truck. The cargo doors are flung open. Sunlight pours in. Jack lifts his head to look, squinting against the light. He resembles some kind of friendly snow creature. Scrimshaw climbs into the truck. One of the henchmen thoughtfully throws a huge fur coat over Scrimshaw's shoulders, making him look even more formidable than before. Snowflakes cling to Jack's eyelashes as he looks up at the towering Scrimshaw. Scrimshaw looks down at Jack impassively, then calls off. Dr. Kanker, get in here. Dr. Margaret Kanker sweeps out of the limo and is helped into the truck's cargo area by a henchman. Scrimshaw indicates Jack. Kanker whips out a stethoscope and checks Jack's chest. Well? Early stage hypothermia. Do we need him alive? Jack's eyes widen at this. Oh yes, he should be alive. Jack looks relieved. Bring a blanket! I know how to warm him. She begins to run her hand up the inside of Jack's leg. Jack's eyes widen again. Knock it off, Margaret. Here comes the blanket. The henchman clambers onto the truck with an instantly produced blanket and drapes it over Jack's shoulders. We're talking to him to the lab now, Mr. Scrimshaw. Would you like to ride in a limo? No, no, go on ahead. It's a short trip. I'm gonna stay back here and keep my eye on him. I'll stay with him. Forget it, Margaret. Take the limo. Kanker pick, packs up her metal, medical bag as if she didn't care. Exterior truck. A henchman closes the truck's cargo doors and jumps into the limo. The limo drives away. Then the truck begins to rumble off as well. Interior truck's cargo area. Scrimshaw pulls up a box of frozen food and takes a seat next to Jack. He lights up a fat cigar and blows smoke into the air. Nuclear weapons, Jack. They mean nothing. Everybody's got them. Nobody's got the balls to use them. Am I right? Jack shivers silently, not daring to say a word. Space, you say. Space is a flop. Didn't you know that? An endless junkyard of orbiting debris. Ah, uh, but miniaturization, Jack. That's the ticket. It's the edge everyone's been looking for. But who will have that edge, Jack? What country will control miniaturization? Frankly, I don't give a shit. I'm only in this for the money. That's why we gotta get that little pod out from inside of you. Scrimshaw punctuates this remark with a finger jabbed forcefully into Jack's ribs. Jack looks worried. Scrimshaw settles back to enjoy his cigar. Exterior highway day. Lydia zips along in the open-topped Ferrari. A truck tries to pass her. She casually glances up at its driver, and recognizes I go behind the wheel. Lydia reacts. She lightens up on the gas, allowing the truck to pull ahead of her. Interior of the pod. I have some bad news for us, Jack. Looks like we've fallen into the hands of the bad guys. They're taking us to some lab, and I don't like the sound of that. Jack, inside the truck, listens in silence. Huddled under the blanket, he has, he's begun to warm up a bit. Hey, Jack, glance around slowly so I can get a lay of the land. Jack's POV is his eyes pan. Boxes of frozen foods come into view. Then the hulking fur-coated scrimshaw sitting nearby. Then the cargo doors. But go back, Jack. Go back. Go back to the doors. Jack's glance returns to the doors. We see that they are not properly closed. The latch is not in place. A crack of daylight shows through. Tuck, inside the pod, views the unlocked doors on his monitor. 
Okay, Jack, this is it. Doors are unlocked. We can take him by surprise. Bust out here before they know what hit him. Can you do it, Jack? Cough if you can do it. Chuck waits for the cough. Silence. Okay, Jack, listen to me. This is your moment. This is your turn to be a hero, Jack. Psych yourself up, Jack. Look at those doors. You gonna stack soup cans all your life, Jack? See yourself leaping to your feet. Come on, you wanna bag groceries until you die, Jack? See yourself pushing open the door. See yourself jumping from the truck. Can you see it, Jack? Can you see it? Jack inside the truck sheds his blanket and jumps to his feet. I didn't say it! Huh? Jack, no one wait until. Jack charges towards the cargo doors and flings them open. Too late. The doors swing out. The highway flies by underneath at 60 miles per hour. Jack clings to one of the doors. Jack holds on for dear life, his feet kicking in midair several feet above the surface of the roadway. Scrimshaw tries to reach out and grab him. He fails. It's just too damn dangerous. Ah, you stupid idiot! Tuck inside the pod shares Jack's POV of his precarious situation. Tuck can't look. He covers his eyes. Lydia, driving in the Ferrari, sees an events sees the events unfolding before her. She's kept back, but now she speeds up. Scrimshaw, inside the truck, begins to pound against the back wall to alert Igo in the driver's cab. Stop the truck! Stop the truck! Igo, inside the cab, has a radio turned up full volume playing Ride of the Valkyries, of course. He can't hear Scrimshaw's <laughs> pounding. We notice that Jack, swinging on the cargo door, is briefly visible in the side view mirror. Igo glances into the mirror, but too late. Jack has already swung back out of sight. Scrimshaw, inside the truck, sees that the door is swinging back toward the truck. He positions himself to grab hold of Jack. Jack sees what's coming. He puts out his foot and kicks off against Scrimshaw's chest. Uh, Jack and the door swing back out over the highway, and Scrimshaw tumbles backwards into the boxes of frozen foods. Lydia, in the Ferrari, zooms up behind the truck. Jump in, Jack! Jump in! Jack looks down. Both vehicles are doing 60, and the door is swinging back and forth. Scrimshaw has gotten to his feet and is advancing unsteadily toward Jack. Chomp! Chomp! Jack lets his feet drop down into the Ferrari, but continues to cling to the door with his hands. The two vehicles begin to drift apart. Jack's hands are attached to one, his feet are attached to the other. It looks like he's being stretched. Lydia reaches out and grabs Jack's pants leg. Let go! Let go, are you crazy?! Lydia steers the Ferrari in closer to the truck. No! Let go! Jack lets go and falls backwards into the Ferrari's passenger seat. Lydia stomps on the gas pedal and roars off ahead of the truck. She sees a sign up ahead, SF International Airport, next exit. She cuts in front of three lanes of traffic, including the truck, and takes the exit. Lydia and Jack exchange an expression of victory. Tuck inside the pod recovers from all the excitement by draining his pocket flask. He's really lost its kick. He tosses the empty flask aside. Interior main concourse, uh, SF International Airport Day. The cowboy strides across the concourse. Jack and Lydia observe the cowboy from a distance. There he is, the cowboy. I've been tracking his movements for months. Jack looks nervous. He glances anxiously at his watch. What has this got to do with Tuck? Good question. Everything cowboy deals in stolen technology. He's a middleman. Why do you think he arrived today? Dollars to donuts, he leads us right to that chip. The cowboy gets on a payphone. Oh, I'd love to know who he's calling. Maybe I can hear. Very funny. I mean it. He's 50 feet away. Let me try. Tuck inside the pod makes the proper adjustments to heighten the sensitivity of Jack's hearing. Jack looks directly at the cowboy and begins to hear, despite the echoing din of the crowded concourse. He's leaving a message for somebody. Victor Scrimshaw. Hey, that was the guy in the truck! Amazed, Lydia fumbles in her pockets for a pad and pencil. Don't believe this. He's staying at the Mark Hopkins Hotel. He wants Scrimshaw to pick him up at six in the morning. Six in the morning? He says he never sleeps. The cowboy hangs up and walks off. Lydia puts away her notebook. Okay. You're amazing. <laughs> You're pr pretty wonderful yourself. 
Lydia smiles awkwardly. Let's go. Uh, As they walk briskly off. Um, who is Victor Scrimshaw anyway? Oh, he's very mysterious and very powerful. I can call the papers for, for yeah, I can call the paper first file when we get there. Get where? It's Mark Hopson, Hopkins Hotel. Exterior Mark Hopkins Hotel day. The cowboy arrives by cab. Moments later, Jack and Lydia drive up in the Ferrari. They disappear into the hotel parking garage. Interior hotel parking garage. Jack finds a parking space. Oddly enough, there are at least 20 other Ferraris parked nearby. Jack and Lydia get out from the car. This place looks like a Ferrari owner's convention. It's the case from the trunk. Huh? I'm checking in. It's so suspicious if I have a suitcase. Jack opens the trunk and discovers the suitcase. How did you know this was here? Tuck always keeps a packed suitcase in the trunk, just in case he wakes up in a strange place. Tuck inside the pod winces painfully. I didn't know she knew about the suitcase. Interior hotel lobby. The cowboy has just registered. A bellboy is taking him to his room. As they walk to the elevators, they pass a signboard that reads, Welcome, Ferrari Owners of America. National Convention Main Ballroom. Interior Cowboys Hotel Room. Cowboy sits on the bed polishing a pair of dressy lizard skin boots. Country and Western music plays loudly from the radio. Interior Jack and Lydia's Hotel Room. They can hear the loud C&W music pounding through the wall. I tipped the desk clerk 20. He put us right next door to the cowboy. Okay, listen for any sound of him leaving his room. I'll be in the bedroom calling my paper. Okay. Jack watches Lydia depart from into the bedroom, his eyes drinking in every inch of her. Tuck inside the pod also ogles Lydia on his monitor, sighing deeply to himself. Then he realizes what's going on. Hey, cut that out! I thought you were a gentleman. Jack inside the hotel room. Oh, come on, Tuck. Who can blame me? She's one in a million. All right, what's the deal between you two anyway? Interior Victor Scrimshaw's office. Scrimshaw is on the phone and he's hopping mad. Margaret, I'm meeting with the cowboy tomorrow and I still don't have that other chip. Interior, a bedroom. Dr. Kanker is sitting on the edge of the bed in a spaghetti strap negligee. The phone pressed to her, pressed to her ear. That's not much time. I... Intercut between Kanker and Scrimshaw. We had him. He slipped right through our fingers. I'm thinking maybe your boy Igo's not all he's cracked up to be, Margaret. Kanker's eyes begin to blaze. You're crazy. He's the most perfect creature on earth. Just then, Igo enters the bedroom wearing a silk robe, carrying a bottle of wine and two glasses. Kanker regards him with adoration. Just find that idiot supermarket clerk and don't let the cowboy out of your sight either. Igo takes the phone from Kanker's hands and hangs it up. She turns and throws open his robe, revealing a tattoo on his chest. Close on tattoo. A large heart filled with roses and a scroll with the name Margaret written across it. Kanker gently runs her fingers over the tattoo, then looks up into Igo's eyes. Come to mama. He embraces her passionately. Interior newspaper press room, day. Dwayne Fornoy is on the phone. Uh... He has punched up Victor Scrimshaw's file on his computer. The monitor before him displays Scrimshaw's picture and bio. This is one mean dude, Lydia. I can't believe this guy. Legal counsel to reputed organized crime figures, administrator of four Teamster pension funds, suspected of black market arms dealing, yet somehow he manages to keep his nose clean. Interior hotel bedroom. Lydia is on the phone taking notes. Anything else? Yeah. They say he keeps Jimmy Hoffa's wristwatch in his desk drawer as a souvenir. Interior of the pod, Tuck casts a concerned glance at his air supply gauge. Hey Jack, we got about nine hours of air left in here. It's about time we formulate a plan. Interior of the hotel room, Jack is stealing a glance at Lydia through the partially closed bedroom door. Now he turns away. Oh, great, a plan, let's do it. Tuck inside the pod seems troubled by Jack's sudden enthusiasm. You're awfully eager, aren't you? Oh, you bet. Uh, I'm into this now. I'm hooked on adventure. What's your plan? Tuck isn't sure he likes this new attitude of Jack's. Okay. Cowboy leaves the chip, right? Right. So, you're going to be the cowboy. Jack in the hotel room wears a frozen half-smile on his face. Me? 
Sure. And when Scrimshaw's men come by to pick up the cowboy, they're going to get you and me instead. Yeah, but I don't look like the cowboy. Let me worry about that. Jack seems hesitant. Then he sees Lydia emerging from the bedroom, her usual vision of efficient loveliness. All right, I'll do it. Uh, Insert uh, the cow. You'll do what? Yeah. I have a plan. Interior, uh, the cowboy's hotel room. The cowboy is trying on a flamboyantly embroidered silk western shirt in front of the mirror. Mama, don't let your sons grow up to be cowboys. He continues to sing as he puts on his generous supply of gold rings, chains, and bracelets. Interior, Jack and Lydia's room. Lydia has just heard Jack's plan and seems resistant. I don't know, Jack. It's a good plan, but it, it seems dangerous. Victor Scrimshaw likes to play hardball. Not afraid. Well, neither am I. I've never run from danger in my life. Well, don't start now. I'm not going to. But are you sure you can pull this off? <clears throat> well, I have two years of high school drama under my belt. As a matter of fact, I once understudied the Sky Masterson role in production of Guys and Dolls. Good, good. That's good, Jack. Okay, the thing to do now is to stay close to the cowboy. Wherever he goes tonight, that's where we're going. Um, we're not exactly dressed for a night on the town. No, oh, there's a dress shop in the lobby. You can dip into Tuck's suitcase. Uh, Tuck Go ahead. Pod. Go ahead. Dip all you want. Nothing will fit you. Interior of the hotel room later. Jack has just finished dressing into Tuck's clothes. A rumpled but sporty look, and everything fits. Lydia emerges from the bedroom in her new dress. Jack turns in a direction and has to gasp for breath. You look beautiful. Thank you, Jack. And you look... Her voice trails off. A wistful look comes into her expression, and she gently runs her hand down Jack's lapel. What's the matter? No, oh, nothing. I was just reminded of the time when Jack Tuck wore this jacket. Tuck inside the pod seems to melt as he views Lydia's melancholy expression. That was the night we first met. You were writing that article about me. We had dinner and talked until three in the morning. I got drunk and fell down a manhole cover walking you home. Jack and Lydia in the hotel room. The sound of a door closing breaks the mood. What was that? The door. The cowboy, he's leaving. Lydia peeks out into the corridor where the cowboy is walking. He turns down another corridor, passing a room service waiter and heads for the elevators. Camera holds on the room service waiter, who is actually one of Iago's henchmen. He waits for the cowboy to board the elevator, then whips out a walkie-talkie. Cowboy rides. The henchman then wheels his serving tray away. Moments later, Jack and Lydia arrive from the opposite direction and approach the elevators. Exterior of the hotel, night. A new black Mercedes 500 SEL is parked across the street from the hotel. Interior of the 500 SEL. Igo sits in the back, two henchmen sit up front. I love this car. You can't beat German engineering. The henchmen begin to giggle and Igo glares at them. Interior hotel lobby. The doors to the main ballroom swing open and Ferrari owners pour out, talking loudly to one another. At the same moment, the cowboy emerges from the elevators, walks through the mob of Ferrari conventioneers, and out the front door, all the while being observed by another henchman dressed as a bellboy. Bellboy out of this shoot. Interior hotel parking garage, night. Jack and Lydia hurry towards their parked cars. Meanwhile, Ferrari conventioneers arrive at their cars. Engineers fire up throughout the garage. Exterior hotel night. The cowboy waits for a cab. Interior of the 500 SEL night. Igo keeps an eye on the cowboy, sees a cab pull up, and the cowboy climb in. There he goes. Follow that cab. Where'd it go? Uh, Igo looks again, sees Jack's Ferrari drive out of the parking garage. It's him. Who do I follow? 
The Ferrari! The henchman begins to pull away from the curb when... Which Ferrari? Huh? Exterior street in front of hotel, night. Suddenly the street is filled with Ferraris, zooming off in all directions. Many of them look just like Jack's. Interior 500 SEL. Igo's head is spinning as four identical red Ferraris roar by. Forget the Ferrari! Follow the cab! Where, where to go? Everyone looks. In the confusion, the cab has disappeared. Close on Igo, boiling mad, gnashing his teeth, white foam bubbles from his stretched lips. Exterior San Francisco street, night. The Ferrari sticks close to the cab's tail. Interior the Ferrari, traveling, night. A white scarf wrapped around Jack's neck snaps in the wind. Okay, after we get the microchip back, how do we get Tuck? Uh, don't worry, I'm in um, touch with him. You what? I can't figure you out, Jack, but I know there's a lot you're not telling me. Trust me, the, the time will come when I'll tell you everything, but this isn't it. The cab's blowing over. Exterior nightclub night. The cab pulls up to a trendy nightclub and the cowboy jumps out. Loud music fills the air and shakes the walls. People mill around the entrance, a mixture of hardcore punks and adventurous yuppies. One of these people is Wendy. She wears her hair in pink and orange spikes and is dressed in a black leather mini dress studded with metal rivets. Wendy is stunned to see Jack drive up in a Ferrari with Lydia at his side. Her jaw drops open. Uh, Jack leaves the Ferrari in the charge of a parking attendant at the curb. He and Lydia shoulder their way through the crowd toward the club entrance. Jack! Jack turns. He can't believe his eyes. Wendy the punk harlot. <laughs> Wendy? You can't keep her hands off him. My god, Jack, look at you. Oh, uh, look at you, Wendy. I'm going in before we lose him. Lydia pushes her way into the club. Jack wants to follow, but Wendy has a hold of his arm. Interior of the nightclub. Crowded, smoke-filled, music blasting, the dance floor jammed. Jack and Wendy are dancing. As they dance... I can't believe it, Jack. It's so exciting. I mean, how long have you been leading this double life? Oh, um, for a while now. Uh, Jack steals a glance at Lydia and the cowboy, who are also dancing together. The cowboy is wild and uninhibited in his movements. Lydia entices him on, playing up to him. Interior nightclub, much later. Lydia and the cowboy are seated at a table. He smokes a big cigar, drinks whiskey, and whispers in her ear. She laughs and plays with her hair. Jack and Wendy are at a table nearby. Jack's attention is equally divided between Wendy and Lydia. I know I've been mean to you, Jack. I'm a real shit sometimes. It's probably an account of my life sucking like it does. I'm a complete mess, you know? I mean... I think you're the only person at the market I haven't slept with. I'm like, you're the only one I'm even partially attracted to. Jack smiles painfully. That lady is signaling to you? Jack turns and sees Lydia gesturing him over. Jack gets up from his table and Wendy follows. The cowboy sees them approaching. Ah, this is getting good. Cowboy, this is Jack and, uh... Wendy? Howdy, Wendy and Jack. Jack and Wendy sit down. Hi, cowboy. The cowboy smiles broadly and looks from one face to the next. Hey, say, looks like we got just the right number for a foursome. Jack, Lydia, and Wendy are speechless. Finally, it's golf. The cowboy laughs uproariously and pounds the table. Ha, 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 Jack, you are a real clown. Uh, come on, cowboy, let's dance. The cowboy leaps to his feet. Okay, Buffalo gal, do the cotton eye Joe. Cowboy and Lydia dance off. So weirdo. The bar, later. Jack is paying for two beers as Lydia comes up behind him. He's taking me back to the hotel. I'll go with you. No, we're taking a cab. Follow us. I have to go. She hurries away. Jack takes the beers to Wendy, who is waiting for him at the table. Sorry, Wendy. I, I gotta go. Oh, okay. See you, Jack. Jack smiles back and hurries off. Wendy watches him go with a sad expression on her face. Exterior San Francisco street, night. Four o'clock in the morning. The streets are deserted. The sun is almost coming up. The Ferrari streaks by. Interior of the Ferrari. Jack behind the wheel. Hurry up. I'm speeding now. I'm doing 50. Don't leave her alone in that hotel room with that sleazy cowboy. 
I don't put them together any more than you do. You don't? Why not? Well, I... I knew it! You're in love with her! I hardly know her! In love with her? Are you? Well... You are. Damn. Shit. Exterior of the hotel, night. A cab pulls up. The cowboy climbs out with Lydia. Interior, 500 SEL, night. Parked across from the hotel with two henchmen inside. They observe the cowboy's return. Good. He's back. Yeah, he got lucky. Good for him. Now let's go home and get some sleep. Oh, no. Look. It's a Ferrari. We see Jack's Ferrari entering the parking garage. So what? It's the the tenth one tonight. Let's go. Interior hotel corridor. Jack strides purposefully down the corridor toward the cowboy's room. I got your adrenaline pumping. Can you feel it? I can feel it. You're strong. Very strong. You feel strong, Jack? I feel strong. This is room. Four. Bash. Jack kicks open the door. Interior the cowboy's room. The cowboy is caught standing in the middle of the room, wearing nothing but his Stetson hat and European-style black bikini underwear. Jack reacts to the sight. Ah, Big Jack! Son of a bitch. Jack's fist flies out. Pow! Catching the cowboy on the jaw and sending him unconscious to the floor. Lydia rushes in from the corridor. What happened? Where were you? I'm still in my room. Oops. Anyway, Jack. Dissolve to interior pod. Uh, what gives people certain physical characteristics? Genes. Think we can tamper with his genes a little? Sounds like fun, I'll admit, but genetic alteration can only occur before conception. Shit. Tuck looks depressed, then... Were you thinking permanent or temporary changes? Temporary. Oh, that's different. Interior hotel room later. Lydia knocks on the closed bathroom door. How's it going in there? Fine, fine. Just give me a few minutes. Interior of the bathroom. The cowboy is bound and gagged and seated on the toilet. Jack, dressed in the cowboy's western attire, stands before the mirror looking at himself. All right, get ready. Uh, what I'm going to do is... Electronically stimulate your glands. Let's see if I can enhance your hormonal secretions. Jack shudders at the thought. Here goes. Close on Jack's face as portions of it begin to bulge. Forehead, bridge of the nose, chin. They swell slightly, then recede, then swell again in a horrific ripple effect. The cowboy observes this hideous display with frantic alarm. His eyes pop and he struggles against his gag and bindings. Wait, well, I'm getting the hang of this now. How's this? A cracking, stretching sound is heard, and Jack's nose begins to get thinner and longer. You're muted, Jack. Just say now. Thank you. That's it. That's his nose exactly. <laughs> right, let's go for the cheekbones now. Pop, snap. Jack's cheekbones become distinctly more sculptured. Perfect. The cowboy could take no more of this bizarre event. He faints dead away. Interior hotel room later. The bathroom door opens and Jack strides out as the cowboy. He's an almost perfect twin. Lydia gasps. Jack? Yep. Oh my god, Jack. She does a 360 degree tour of his body. Same. Oh my god. Oh my god. Then a knock at the door. Lydia and Jack tense up. Showtime! Open the door. Lydia opens the door to two of Igo's henchmen. Mr. Cowboy, we're ready to take you to see Mr. Scrimshaw. Good, let's hit the trail. Jack does a reasonably good imitation of the cowboy's strange accent and guttural tone. Jack and Lydia begin to leave when one of the henchmen holds Lydia back. The one night of stays. Lydia flashes Jack a threatening look. Jack good-naturedly throws an arm around her shoulder. Nonsense, boys. I, I don't go nowhere without this little Billy. 
The henchmen shrug indifferently. Lydia smiles at Jack. As they leave the room, Jack is certain to leave the Do Not Disturb sign dangling from the doorknob. Exterior Napa Valley morning. A limo glides silently through the rolling hills of the Napa Valley uh, wine country. Interior of the limo morning. The two henchmen ride up front, Jack and Lydia in back. They glance out the window and wonder where they're being taken. Tuck inside the pod glances at his air supply gauge. Three hours of air left, Jack. We're cutting this a bit close. No reply from Jack. Hey, wait a minute. Why didn't I think of this before? I'll go to the lungs, open up the hatch, take a, uh, take a more air. Take me uh, to the lungs. Uh, I have some bad news for you. The hatch only opens from the outside. Tuck looks stunned. He tries the hatch. The computer is right. Damn it. Leave it to the inventor of a 3D action, man. Sorry, player number one. Exterior of the limo, morning. It leaves the main highway and turns up a narrow dirt road that winds into the hills. Exterior of Scrimshaw's compound, morning. The limo enters the walled-in compound nestled deep in the Napa Hills. The limo parks, and Jack and Lydia are greeted by two more henchmen who lead them away. Also parked in the drive is Igo's Black 500 SEL. Exterior of the compound. Several dwellings occupy the compound grounds. Jack and Lydia are taken on a tangled journey between buildings, through a courtyard and down a long, narrow pre breezeway. Jack glances at a huge wrought iron aviary housing a large assortment of rare and exotic birds. Interior, a solarium. Jack and Lydia are ushered into the solarium, a glassed-in veranda, where a large breakfast table has been set. Seated at the table are several henchmen, Dr. Kanker and Victor Scrimshaw, dressed in an elegant summer suit. A friendly-looking golden retriever is curled restfully on the floor near its food dish. Scrimshaw rises. Hello, cowboy. Come in. Sit down. Join us. Do you, do you think we're close friends? Hope not. Jack and Lydia approach the table. How long has it been, cowboy? Uh, you tell me. Almost I ten years. Both Jack and Lydia look relieved. Don't you remember? I.D. Amon's barbecue? Oh yes, how could I forget? You haven't forgot the last time we saw each other, have you, cowboy? Jack smiles uncomfortably. You look taller, cowboy. Uh, lips. He points down to his cowboy boots. Scrimshaw nods, then signals to his servant with the coffee pot. Sit down, coffee. Jack and Lydia glance around the table at the decidedly unfriendly faces of the henchmen. They sit. Scrimshaw produces two cigars from his pocket. Please join me. I believe these are the kind you like, Cuban. Jack takes the cigar and lights up apprehensively. This is probably his first cigar. He draws in deeply. Tuck inside the pod, looks out through the viewing dome, sees a thick cloud of smoke rolling his way. Uh, the smoke envelops the pod, darkening everything. Tuck seems alarmed. He turns on his high beams. Jack is choking on cigar smoke. Lydia slaps him on the back. Scrimshaw looks on. Finally, Jack regains his composure. He puts the cigar to one side. All right, then. So much for the pleasantry. Let's get down to business. Dr. Kanker? Kanker clears the throat. <clears throat> Miniaturization works on a dual chip system. We have one chip in our possession at this moment. We will have the other one shortly. Scrimshaw anticipates an angry reaction from Jack, but doesn't get one. Fine. I'll take what you've got. Kanker and Scrimshaw exchange a look. You do understand. The first chip only miniaturizes. Both chips are required for re-enlargement. Right. Um, well, we, we whet their appetites with what you've got. Good point. Show them the chip. Panker takes a gold pillbox from her pocket and places it on the table. Jack and Lydia conceal their excitement. Panker opens the pillbox and holds up the chip with a pair of surgical tweezers. Tuck inside the pod sees the chip on his display monitor. There it is. The only thing on earth that can save him. So close and yet so far. 
Jack and Lydia react to the chip the same as Tuck. Jack reaches out for it. Not so fast, my friend. If I let you take the chip, you must leave something behind as collateral. Scrimshaw glances at Jack's hand. Jack wears one of the cowboy's flashy gold rings. That. The ring? No. The finger. Jack and Lydia react, tuck inside the pod. That bastard. Return to scene. One of the henchmen grabs Jack's wrist and slams his hand to the tabletop. Don't worry, cowboy. When it comes to reattaching severed limbs, Dr. Kanker here has pioneered the field. We'll just keep that little baby on ice for you. What? 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 Crimshaw snaps his fingers and Igo enters the solarium. Lydia quickly turns her face away, fearing Igo will recognize her. Igo holds a surgical scalpel in his hand. Sun sunlight glistens off its blade. Interior of the pod. Tuck looks in his monitor and sees that Igo has arrived on the scene. Then his electronic equipment begins to buzzle and crackle. Dials begin to spin, just like in the Chinatown restaurant. Damn it. Every time this guy shows up, my equipment goes haywire. That's got a pacemaker? He loses radio and video contact. Lights flash on and off. Jack? Jack, can you hear me, Jack? Look, something gone wrong. I can't, I can't hold the balance on these hormones. Return to the veranda where everyone is looking at Jack in absolute stunned horror. On Jack, as his face begins to stretch and bulge, the hormones are totally out of control. His skull begins to enlarge, his neck thickens, his nose turns into an animal's snout and pushes forward from his face. Horrible snapping, stretching, cracking sounds are heard. Jack moans painfully. Lydia, Scrimshaw, Kanker, Igo, henchmen, and servants can't believe their eyes. God in heaven, deliver us from Satan! A servant drops the coffee pot with a crash. Kanker gasps, Lydia screams. And then Jack's face abruptly snaps back to normal, and everyone sees that he is not the cowboy at all. It's him! The one with the pod! Get him! Jack grabs the chip and tries to escape. He's got the chip! Henchmen rush towards Jack. Lydia upends the table in their faces. Coffee and breakfast muffins go flying. Henchmen slip on the solarium's tile floor. Igo leaps in front of Jack, blocking his path. Lydia! Catch! Jack tosses the chip towards Lydia, but it goes over her shoulder and lands in the dog dish with a soft plop. Igo throws his arms around Jack and locks him in a vice-like bear hug. We hear Jack's bones begin to snap. Scrimshaw pushes the golden retriever away from its dish. Get out of there! He begins to dig around in the gooey cow can for the chip. Tuck inside the pod can feel the pod's walls begin to bend as Jack is being squeezed by Igo. Scrimshaw finds the chip, he holds it up in his sticky brown hand and turns to Igo. Hey, don't kill him. Lock him up. The girl, too. Igo releases Jack, who has gone cross-eyed from Igo's squeezing. Interior, a wine cellar. Jack and Lydia are locked in the cellar. Jack frantically looks for a way out. We gotta get out of here. There's only two hours left. Don't just stand there. Help. Not until you tell me what's going on, and I want to know everything right now. Jack is silent for a moment. What the hell? Might as well tell her. Interior of the compound, day. Dr. Kanker hangs up the phone and turns to Scrimshaw. We're preparing the lab now. Good. We'll take the choppers. Interior of the wine cellar. Lydia wears a delirious, flabbergasted expression of skepticism and disbelief. I don't think she believes us. You're talking to him right now, aren't you? No, no. It can't be true. Talk inside the pod. Now it's to prove it to her. All right, Jack, repeat to Lydia exactly what I say. Back to Jack in the wine cellar. Okay. Jack approaches Lydia. She looks at him expectantly. Lydia, you were right. I do fight too much, and I drink too much, and I've ruined everything that's good in my life. You were the best thing in it, Lydia, and I threw you away, too. I'm a big, dumb palooka. Just like you said I was. Lydia is convinced. Her mouth drops open and her eyes moisten. She's looking at Jack, but she's seeing Tuck. Oh, Tuck. It is you. She throws her arms around Jack's neck. Jack isn't sure what to do with his arms. He steps back from Lydia. Okay, wait a minute here. 
Lydia looks perplexed as well she might considering the situation. Tuck, I want a moment alone. Huh? Shut down your sensors. No sound, no picture. Fucking bad idea, Jack. I'll be navigating in the dark. Uh, what if I can't restore contact? No, no, Jack. I can't do that. I want a moment alone. Alone with Lydia, you mean? You owe me this, Tuck. It dawns on Lydia that she's in the middle. Silence. Then... Okay, Jack. Signing off. Tuck cuts out. Jack can feel a change in his body, a momentary sensation of freedom that is reflected in his expression. He takes Lydia's hands in both of his own. Lydia, I'm not sure what I want to say to you. I've only known you for less than a day, but... Loud footsteps are heard coming down the cellar steps. They're coming. Well, no time for words. Jack impulsively takes Lydia in his arms and kisses her. Exterior of the pod, swirling and spinning, caught in a whirlpool, a ma maelstrom of foaming liquid. Interior of the pod, Tuck fights for control of the craft. What he sees outside his viewing dome resembles an undersea view of the crashing surf. But in truth, it is mere human saliva. Interior of the wine cellar, Jack breaks the kiss and Lydia's eyes remain closed. Then the door is thrown open and Igo stands framed in the doorway. Let's go! Interior of the pod. Tuck is trying frantically to restore communications to his pod. Jack. Jack, do you read me? Damn. No reception. I knew I shouldn't have shut down my sensors. Where am I anyway? Exterior skies above the Napa Valley Day. A pair of Bell Jet Ranger helicopters fly over the landscape, heading towards San Francisco. Interior the first chopper. Scrimshaw, Dr. Kinker, and a henchman pilot. Interior, the second chopper. Jack, Lydia, Igo, and another henchman pilot. Jack and Lydia exchange worried glances. Meanwhile, exterior of the pod, traveling swiftly on a twisting channel where, whose sides are made up of delicate, convoluted folds. The floodlights atop the pod illuminate the way. Interior of the pod. Tuck looks out the viewing dome. The twisting channel is opening into a dark, hollow chamber. And then Tuck sees something more incredible than anything he has ever seen in his entire life. His eyes widen and his jaw drops open in, his, in astonishment. Oh my god. This is what Tuck sees. A human fetus, eight weeks old, curled in its sack of amniotic fluid. A tiny, unformed human being, almost transparent. Exterior of the pod. It sails up to the fetus in the sack, which in reality is only one in inch long, but dwarfs the pod like a giant. Tuck, inside the pod, views the fetus, awed and overwhelmed by the miracle of human life. Moved, speechless. Then it hits him. Lydia. Exterior secret warehouse lab day. The helicopters land atop the warehouse situated on the docks. Everyone piles out and disappears down a rooftop access. Interior of the lab. Jack and Lydia are ushered into the lab. Busy technicians are involved with their work. Kanker leads everyone to a pod resting on a platform. It looks very much like Tuck's pod, except its color is a flat metallic black. We will call it the black pod. There it is. What is it? Our pod. Perhaps not as sophisticated as the one inside Mr. Putter, but I think it will get the job done. Jack and Lydia exchange a puzzled glance. What job? We'll use the chip we have. Mr. Igo will be placed in our pod, miniaturized and injected into Mr. Putter. We will then locate our pod, eliminate its pilot by whatever means necessary, take command of it, and retrieve the, check the second chip. Jack and Lydia's expressions darken. Prepare the miniaturizer! Where can we stash the girl? Use my office. Scrimshaw signals to the henchman who whisks Lydia away. Jack is taken to a stainless steel table and lashed down. Interior Dr. Kanker's office. Lydia and the henchman enter the office. The henchman pushes Lydia toward a chair. Just sit down and shut up. Lydia does as she's told. Interior of the lab. Igo is now seated inside the black pod. Engage the PEM the 5000. PEM, functional. Lower the miniaturization cone. A clear glass cone is lowered from above, engulfing the pod. Jack watches in wide-eyed wonderment. Interior Kanker's office. Lydia snakes her hand into her purse. Suddenly, she's on her feet with the electronic stun gun pointed at the henchman. 
Stay right where you are. This is an electronic stun gun, a non-lethal personal defense weapon. Deploying a charge of 5,000... What the hell? Zap! She fires the gun. 5,000 volts enter the henchman's body. He sinks to his knees but doesn't fall forward. He just kneels there, stunned. Lydia grabs the phone and dials. Dwayne, it's me, Lydia. Listen carefully. I'm being held in a warehouse somewhere along the Embarcadero. You've got to reach Pete Blanchard for me. Interior newspaper press room. Day. Dwayne Flournoy is on the phone. Blanchard? Hell, I'll call the police. Intercut between Lydia and Dwayne. Well, well, yes, call the police, but call Blanchard to tell him we've got Tuck Pendleton. Tuck who? Pendleton. He'll understand. Tell him we're coming with Tuck. Dr. Niles has got to get ready for us at the vector scope. Lydia... Are you in as much trouble as you sound? Maybe more. Tell the police to look for the warehouse with the helicopters on the roof. Whatever you say, Lydia. Thanks, Dwayne. Lydia hangs up the phone. She glances around the office and spots Kanker's lab coat hanging from a hook. She puts it on. She goes to the stunned henchman, takes the pistol from under his coat, and slips it into her pocket. Then she exits the office. As the door slams behind her, the kneeling henchman crashes face first onto the floor. Interior lab hallway. Lydia moves briskly down the hallway. She arrives at an intersection and stops to look both ways before proceeding. Lydia. Lydia gasps, jumps, and spins around. Help! Lydia. Me, Tuck. Tuck, where? Oh, no. But how? He wants to kiss Jack, Lydia. I only... I... I... I mean, he kissed me. Uh, it's not important. We've got to get that chip. My time is running out. What about Jack? Can't leave without him. Interior of the lab. Lydia slips in unnoticed wearing the lab coat. She stands among the other technicians. Jack is strapped to the table. Kanker looms over him with a long hypodermic needle. Jack tries to wiggle free. Ready to inject the pod into the subject. Wait a minute. After Igo takes command of their pod, how do we get the chip out? Mr. Igo will pilot the pod out through a tear duct or sweat gland. Why chance it? As soon as he takes over the pod and gets the chip, let's re-enlarge. While it's still inside, Mr. Putter? Sure. Jack and Lydia react in horror. Do you have any idea what kind of mess that would make? Hearing this, Jack struggles valiantly against his bindings. Tuck! Give me some adrenaline! Make me strong, Tuck! Jack strains and strains and strains. His veins pop out in his neck and... Snap, 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 snap! He frees himself. Look! He's loose! Grab him! Lab technicians rush forward to seize Jack. He struggles manfully, but there are too many of them. Kanker jabs the needle into Jack's arm and injects Igo and the black pod into his body. He's in! Igo's in! Lydia pulls out the pistol taken from the henchman and fires it into the air. Everyone jumps. Let go of him! There are no heroes here, only scientists and engineers. They release Jack immediately. Lydia comes over to his side. So, you wanted to enlarge the pod while it was still inside me, huh? Well, let's see who has the last laugh now. Everybody in the miniaturizer! Exterior, a San Francisco street, day. Police cars speed through the streets, sirens sounding. Interior of the lab. Held at gunpoint, Scrimshaw, Kanker, and the lab techs watch the miniaturization cone descend down upon them. I'll get you for this, Margaret. The cone finally engulfs them now. Let's go. Wait, the chip. Jack goes back to the circuit board, finds the chip, and yanks it free. I'll take that now. Jack looks up and sees that the henchman who Lydia stunned has returned, and he's got an automatic rifle pointed at him. Hand it over. Jack doesn't want to give up the chip. An idea hits him. Here comes Tuck! So saying, he pops the chip into his mouth and swallows it. At the same moment, Lydia comes up behind the henchman and clubs him over the head with her gun. He once again sinks to his knees. Let's go! They make a dash for a corridor, slamming a heavy metal door behind them. Interior of the corridor. They run down the corridor. Where's the chip? I swallowed it. Lydia winces to herself. Now they realize that they have sealed themselves into a dead-end hallway. 
but they spot a ladder that leads to a trapdoor in the ceiling. The roof. Let's go. Exterior of the roof. They emerge onto the roof and see the parked helicopters. It's our only chance. Then they see that the choppers are being guarded by another henchman. Don't worry. Tuck's giving me the, the strength of ten men. I'll handle this. But don't tell him now. Jack leaps at the henchman with flying feet and fists of fury. Wham, bam, pow. The henchman goes flying off the roof. Exterior an alley. The henchman who Lydia clubbed with her gun has regained consciousness and now staggers out into the alley with his automatic rifle. He looks up and sees his comrades falling from the sky. Boom. The falling henchman lands on top of the other one, knocking them both out cold. Exterior of the rooftop. Jack and Lydia board one of the choppers and strap themselves in. Come on, Tuck. Tell me how to fly this thing. Jack. Not now, Lydia. Tuck, give me instructions. He can't, Jack. He's not in you anymore. He, he's in me. <laughs> Jack looks flabbergasted. It takes him a moment to recover. For how long? Since the wine cellar. You mean when I broke and when I hit and then he, and he fell over the thing? It wasn't Taku. It was you, Jack. All you. We better get this thing in the air. I'm on the tip of your tongue. Give me back to Jack. Kiss him. Lydia grabs Jack and plants one on his lips. His eyes widen into saucers as Lydia's tongue goes into his mouth. Exterior of the pod. Propelled with a mighty force and a swirl of foaming saliva back into Jack's body. Interior of the chopper. Lydia breaks the kiss. Oh. Wow. What was that for? Ready? <laughs> oh. Tuck inside the pod. Jack, turn on the master switch, disengage the clutch, and start the ignition. We've got two sticks in the side, one for each hand. Here's the four. Uh, interior of the lab. The police burst in, but stop short at the sight of the weirdly shimmering miniaturization cone. Stay back, man! He pulls a handle and the cone begins to rise. The policemen watch with bated breath until Kanker, Scrimshaw, and the lab techs are fully revealed, each one about two feet tall. Jesus Christ, Captain Munchkins! Exterior of the rooftop, the chopper lifts off into the sky. Exterior of the alley, the henchmen are coming to their senses. They look up and see the chopper flying off. They clamber up a fire escape toward the rooftop and the second chopper. Exterior of the chopper, it flies erratically out over the bay, then practically drops from the sky, plunging toward the water. Then, only several feet from the water's surface, it levels off and begins to gain altitude. Interior of the chopper, flying. Jack has a firm grip on both sticks, if not the situation itself. Tuck inside the pod. I'd like to keep your RPMs in the green, Jack. Gotta reach that microchip before the other guy does. He turns to one of his display monitors. It shows a wireframe image of Jack's body. Two lights are blinking. One represents the chip, the other represents the black pod. Player number two is taking the digestive system. Right. I'm gonna beat him by taking the circulatory system, can I? Yes, but that means going through the heart, player number one. I know. That's worth a shot. Hey, uh, Jack, I'm gonna go through your heart. Could get Harry in there. Uh, your pulse rate uh, is up to 170. My pod might not withstand the beating. Exterior black pod. Coursing through the soft muscle tissue that resembles huge strands of wire rope. Igo is visible through the cockpit dome. Interior of the black pod. Igo checks his instruments. Sonar blips pinpoint the location of the chip in Tuck's pod. Igo is surprised by what he sees. Ha ha, you fool. You'll never make it through the hot. Exterior rooftop of warehouse lab. The two henchmen take off in the second chopper. Exterior San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge. Jack's chopper almost clips the top of the bridge. Interior of the chopper. Huh, that was close. How do I find vector scope? Follow the freeways. Exterior of the chopper. Speeding at a low altitude over the freeway, getting lower and lower. Interior of the chopper. Jack and Lydia in a panic. I said follow the freeway, not take the freeway. I can't get back up into the... Jack, look! Jack's POV. They are fast approaching the mouth of the Bay Bridge Tunnel, flying only inches above the traffic below them. Oh, no! Interior of the tunnel. The chopper roars into the tunnel above the traffic. Motorists gawk and brake, tires screech, horns blow. Exterior of the tunnel. 
The chopper emerges from the tunnel and begins to climb. Enter cut the following. The chip floating through Jack's stomach, headed for the small intestine. The pods sailing through the pulmonary veins toward the left ventricle of the heart. The black pods sliding down the endlessly long esophagus toward the stomach. Tuck inside the pod. Try to slow down your pulse, right? I'm about to enter your left ventricle. Exterior of the chopper, flying backwards across the sky. Interior of the chopper. Jack and Lydia look stunned as they speed through the air in reverse. Oh, I am in. I am in the ventricle, Jack. Stay calm. Stay calm. Jack tries to take a deep, calming breath when the enemy chopper, piloted by the henchman, appears in the sky. Jack, over there! Jack turns, sees the enemy chopper. Ah! Interior of the left ventricle. Jack's fear causes a sudden rush of blood into the ventricle, followed by strong ventricle contractions. The pod is buffeted and tossed like a beer can in the pounding surf. Interior of the pod. Tuck fights for control of his craft. It shakes and vibrates. Interior lights dim and flash. It seems the pod will tear apart at the seams. Tuck almost blacks out. Then he sees the, aer the aortic arch offering four distinct pathways out of the heart. Tuck inside the pod. Out of the aortic arch. I'm almost out. I gotta make it through the opening on the right. He pulls hard on the control stick. The pod begins to turn. It trembles and shakes. Portions of the side walls are pushed inward by the tremendous pressure. Gates shatter. Warning lights flash and buzz. Exterior of the pod. Slamming against the muscle-lined vascular wall, bouncing back, shooting through the proper archway into the relative calm of the aorta. I'm through! Interior of the black pod. Igo views his sonar scanner in disbelief. The blip tells him that Tuck has made it safe through the, through the heart. Impossible! Interior of the stomach. Tuck's pod blasts through the membrane lining of the stomach wall. I'm in the stomach. Outside of the bandit. Interior of the black pod. Igo enters the stomach. He can see Tuck's pod up ahead. He swings his laser gun sighting device into place. Exterior of the sky. Jack and the enemy chopper are engaged in a nasty dog fight. The henchman fires at Jack's chopper with his automatic rifle. Somehow Jack is able to maneuver out of the line of fire. Interior of the stomach. A dog fight of a different kind rages here. Both pods dart around the stomach, shooting laser beams at each other. A stray laser beam hits the stomach wall, burning a small hole in it. Interior of the chopper. Jack winces and grabs his stomach. Are you all right? Then the enemy chopper comes up right beside Jack. The henchman inside levels his automatic weapon, but before he can fire, a Huey Cobra U.S. military helicopter thunders out of the clouds like a bad dream and fires a heat-seeking missile. The missile screams across the skies and hits the enemy chopper. It explodes in a ball of fire and evaporates into dust. Jack and Lydia watch it happen with dazed expressions. Interior Huey Cobra. Pete Blanchard, wearing his military uniform, is on the radio phone. That one was for you, Tuck. Lydia, you can tell him I've put my uniform back on. We're taking you in, Lydia. Follow us down. Interior of the stomach. Meanwhile, the two pods play cat and mouse through the corridors of the gastric glands in the upper stomach. Tuck gets the edge on Igo and fires his laser. Direct hit. Interior ah. pod. Nice shooting. It. Nice shooting, player number one. Yeah, stop calling me that. This isn't a video game. It's real life. I agree, player number one. Advance to second level. Interior, the black pod. Corrosive hydrochloric acid pours into the pod through the hole blasted by Tuck's laser beam. Damn, stomach acid. The interior of the black pod is being rapidly eaten away. It looks bad for Igo. Interior, the small intestine. Tuck's pod locates the chip at the opening of the intestine, but the chip is many times larger than the pod. Nonetheless, the pod's articulating arms reach out and take hold of it. Interior, the chopper, zipping along beside the great Huey Cobra. I've got the chip. He's got it! Lydia gives a silent cheer. Coming up the esophagus with it, I'm going to plant it right on your tongue. Look, how much further than the vectorscope? Jack looks down. Uh, we're over San Jose now. How's your air supply? Tuck, inside the pod, glances at his mission clock. 20 minutes. Interior of the stomach. Igo abandons his disintegrating pod and swims out into the caverns of the upper stomach. Tuck's pod sails by, pushing the enormous chip before it. Igo waits for the right moment, then grabs hold of Tuck's pod. He clings on tightly, crawls to the top, and pries open the hatch with his fingers. Inside the pod, Tuck swivels in his chair to see Igo entering the pod. Igo's mighty hands clamp down around Tuck's neck. The fight is on. Exterior Vector Scope Labs Day. A battalion of U.S. infantry soldiers have assembled in the parking lot. Dwayne Flournoy is there as well. 
The two choppers appear in the sky. The Huey Cobra is the first to touch down. Interior Jack's chopper flying. Tuck? How do I land this thing? Tuck? Can anything ever be easy? Interior of the pod. Tuck and Igo duke it out. Tuck's face is bloody, but not Igo's. Exterior of the pod. Moving swiftly up the esophagus with the chip, even as Tuck and Igo struggle inside. Exterior vector scope labs. Jack's chopper comes down hard. Blanchard, Flournoy, and inf infantrymen rush to help Jack and Lydia out. Everyone then dashes into the lab. Interior pod. Tuck and Igo slam against the pod's various instruments. Tuck puts his hand to his jumpsuit pocket. Shit! You broke my lucky flask! An exposed wire buzzes. Igo leaps back from it like a scared child. Tuck is surprised by this reaction. A little electricity, huh? Igo can't take his eyes off the crackling wire. Tuck takes advantage of the distraction and drives his fist into Igo's stomach. In fact, Tuck hits Igo so hard that his arm sinks into Igo's body clear up to his elbow. Tuck looks horrified. He pulls his arm out and with it, much of Igo's inner workings. Wires, circuits, relays, diodes, switches. They all come tumbling out in one big tangled humming heap. An android! Igo begins to short circuit. Smoke billows out from all the openings in his body. A hissing noise. Sparking wires. Then Igo erupts into flames. Tuck jumps back. Camera moves in close on Igo's tattoo. Flames shrivel and melt the skin on Igo's chest and the heart-shaped tattoo with Margaret's name in the center begins to perish. Tuck grabs an onboard extinguisher and tries to douse the fire. Igo is melting right before his eyes and the pot is filling with an acrid black smoke. The air supply gauge begins to flash. Warning, warning. <coughs> is consuming your remaining air. The fire is consuming your remaining air. Where are we now? <coughs> Middle esophagus. Too far to go. Not enough air. Only one chance to make it. What? Tell me. A human sneeze has been clocked at over 100 miles per hour. Tuck turns to his mic. Jack, you gotta sneeze. Interior vectorscope lab, where it all began. Dr. Niles and his technicians surround Jack. Sneeze? I can't sneeze. Tuck inside the pod. Look, you have to. Think, think allergies, ragweed, pollen, catch for, um, uh... Fungus spores! Dust mites! I thought that was anal dander for a second. Animal dander! <laughs> Jack's eyes begin to tear up and redden at the thought of the anal dander. Uh, uh. Tuck inside the pod braces himself. He can feel the sneeze coming. The pod begins to tremble as Jack's respiratory system starts to convulse. We're in the world like the power of suggestion. Close on Jack. Uh, the pod is no more than a blur as it rockets up the esophagus at near warp speed. Tuck is pressed flat against the pod's rear wall, his face horribly contorted by the powerful forward thrust. Close on Jack's nose and mouth, the sneeze explodes out in slow motion, a glistening spray of mucus and saliva containing both the chip and the pod, all of which splatters against the face and glasses of Dr. Niles. Normal speed resumes as technicians rush to Niles. There's the chip! It's sliding down Niles' cheek. They quickly remove it, then search Niles' face for the pod. I see it. Bring a slide. The pod is placed on a glass slide. Quickly, quickly! Re-enlarger functional. Niles presses a button. Lights flash in the lab. An incredible high-pitched whistle is heard. Everyone is forced to cover their ears, and then the pod appears. Full size, standing in the middle of the lab, dented and battered, dripping with gooey biochemical waste material and glandular secretions. Smoke pours from its vents. Fire on board! Blanchard rushes forward to open the hatch. Tuck inside the pod holds a handkerchief to his nose and mouth, waiting for the hatch to open. Goodbye, player number one. Tuck gives the computer a farewell glance. Good game. The hatch is then popped open. Interior lab. Tuck scrambles from the hatch with Blanchard's assistance. Get back! It's gonna blow! All scatter, but Tuck suddenly goes back. Yeah. 
Tuck goes to the nose of the pod and tries to pull out the circuit module containing the second chip. It doesn't come free. Several technicians and infantrymen come forward, but Tuck warns them back. They jump away. Finally, Tuck pulls the module free and he dives for safety. The pod explodes. Everyone hits the floor. The lab fills with debris. But when the smoke clears, one by one, all get to their feet. First Blanchard, then Niles, then Flournoy, then Jack, then Lydia, then Tuck. Tuck is a mess. His face bloodied and bruised, his jumpsuit torn, burned, and sweat stained. But Lydia rushes into his arms nonetheless. Tuck! Tuck lifts her off her feet. Lydia. Then looking over Lydia's shoulder, Tuck sees Jack. He sets Lydia gently back on her feet. She sees who he's looking at. Tuck regards Jack with an expression of deep affection and profound appreciation. He steps towards him. To have you back, Captain. Tuck ignores the hand to give Jack an enormous bear hug. Technicians and infantrymen cheer. Lydia wipes a tear from her eye. Now everyone closes in on Tuck to welcome him back. Lydia and Jack become lost in the crowd, but soon Tuck wiggles free and takes Lydia aside. Lydia, we have to talk in private. Tuck takes her into Niles' office, which is visible to the lab proper through a large glass window. Interior Niles' office. I... I... I never got to go up in a space capsule, Lydia. I, I never got to orbit the Earth or, or walk in the moon. But I've just gone to places where no man has ever been before. I, I've done things. I, I've seen things, Lydia, that have opened my eyes to, to you, to, to life, to, to everything. Lydia looks confused and overwhelmed. Tuck tries to slow down a little. It's not too late for me, Lydia. I can change. I, I can be better. I, I'm a different man already. I've known all along. Why, why couldn't I just... Admit it to myself. Admit what, Tuck? That I'm in love with you, of course. Lydia is bowled over. Boy. You broke my heart that morning. You drove off and left me. You're a changed man, Tuck. Lydia, this is a personal question, but I gotta know. Since that last night we spent together, have you spent a night like that with um anyone else? Tuck. Please, Lydia, it, it's important to me. Lydia can see that Tuck means it. All right, Tuck. No, I haven't. You haven't? I've been pretty busy, don't forget. We're gonna have a baby, you know? Lydia gives him a look. You did know, didn't you? I wasn't sure. Be sure, Lydia. I've seen it. Lydia begins to smile. Is it a boy or a girl? Tuck smiles back at her, approaches her, puts his arms around her waist. Didn't even notice. No, I just have to wait and see. Lydia wraps her arms around his neck. For a moment, they just look into each other's eyes. Then they kiss. Interior of the lab. Jack looks through the glass window into Niles' office. He sees Tuck and Lydia. Then they spot him. Jack turns away. Lydia and Tuck come after him. Hey, Jack! Wait! Jack stops, turns to them. Uh, you don't have to say anything. I know you're in love with each other. Tuck and Lydia feel good and bad at the same time. Look, this has been the most exciting 24 hours of my life. I've been chased, kidnapped, frozen, electrocuted, amplified, magnetized, and terrorized. And I haven't felt this good since high school. <laughs> It wasn't the re it wasn't rest I needed. It was adventure, and for one day it was mine. We made a good team, didn't we? Lydia smiles and gives Jack a kiss. Dissolve two exterior deck of a cruise ship. Day. Tuck and Lydia stand together on the deck. Tuck wears a tuxedo and high hat. Lydia wears a wedding dress. The air is filled with flying confetti and brightly colored streamers. A band plays. Tuck cups his hands around his mouth and calls off. Thanks again for the cruise tickets. Exterior of the dock. Jack is on the dock along with a hundred other people who have gathered to see the ship off. Bon voyage! Happy honeymoon! The ship's horn blows and the ship begins to pull away from the dock. Tuck, Tuck and Lydia give Jack a final farewell wave, then turn to each other and kiss. Exterior of the pier. Jack walks away from the deck and the departing ship toward the red Ferrari, which is parked nearby. Jack tosses the keys in his hand as he approaches. Inside the Ferrari, Jack climbs in behind the wheel. For a moment, he just sits there. Then he reaches into the glove compartment and takes out a white silk scarf. 
wraparound sunglasses, pigskin driving gloves, and tweed mo motoring cap. He puts it all on and fires up the Ferrari's powerful engine. Then, one final touch, he takes a cassette from his pocket. Close on cassette, Sam Cooke's greatest hits. Jack slides the cassette into the tape player and turns the volume way up. Cupid, draw back your bow, and let your arrow go straight to my lover's heart for me. Jack listens for a moment, smiles to himself, then shifts the car into gear and squeals away in a cloud of dust. Fade out. The end. A true 80s classic. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you at the next one.